play for you ba da bum 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 Hi, welcome. Welcome to a stream. We're about to get started with our set review that may or may not take three hours. We're seriously trying to do things a little faster. I'm just chilling. Let's let's start by um, first prefacing how we how we view set reviews. I think the point of set reviews is to practice evaluating something. So whether or not you're looking at a house, a stock, or a card, or a potential girlfriend, or a potential career path, you always have to evaluate. You have to look at the information available to you and try to deduce what is a good investment of time, of money, of soul gems, of energy. So I'm fascinated about how in computer card games, 
um, one of the skills that comes up is in the, the ability to evaluate cards. Now what makes cards very tricky and good practice for evaluating things is that things are not what they seem. Sometimes a card looks like it's not very valuable. But that's because in our imagination we're limiting that we we imagine that card only being we, we we box that card actually we look at the card and we say well it's not good because of this and we fail to see we fail to imagine um, other possibilities right so for me a big one from the uh, alliance war set was zivkin bane lord I truly failed to see Zivkin Banelord being a very good card. And now it's one of my favorite cards. I failed to see it. I said, oh, Zivkin Banelord, it's a one attack creature. A one attack creature that's seven cost. How can a one attack creature that's seven cost ever be good? Execute kills it. A one costed card kills it. That's, that's one of the worst things I've ever seen. A card that is one seventh its price can kill this card. And everyone runs that card. It's not like people don't run it. So I have failed to evaluate Zivkin Banelord for its true worth. And I, f I believe the fun in doing set reviews is practicing and having, just trying to evaluate. Like, when we say practice evaluating, all we're doing is evaluating it. And sometimes we're, we're right and sometimes we're wrong. But either way, we're becoming better at evaluating things. And for our audience, instead of focusing on is this card good or is this card bad, our focus is to equip and give people new ways of looking at cards, new ways to evaluate cards so that even if I only did a set review of the agility package and did not do it for willpower, intelligence, and strength, they would know how to look at other cards, how to look at a one drop, how to look at a two drop. What do you expect from one drop? What's the thought process? Okay. So the how we're going to approach this set review is we're going to look at the cards and we're going to think, first we're going to speed through all of them and just talk about what we think just off the top of our head. Afterwards, we're going to go over each card and talk about its worst case scenario, its middling or average case scenario, and then its best case scenario. Feel free to leave at any time, come back, chill. We do not know how long this is going to take. So we got our honey water and we're probably going to take some breaks if it takes too long. So let's go through it quickly. I love this card. Dead drop. Give zero cost. Give a friendly creature slay. Put a completed contract into your hand this turn. It may move to attack creatures in the other lane this turn. If we remember, we'll try to also talk about what decks that each card has found a home in and whether or not a card is still homeless. Because sometimes cards are homeless, such as Moon Touched Guardian of Moons of Elsewhere was a homeless card until hand buff became a thing then it became it found a home so sometimes cards are not used not because they're not good it's because they just haven't found the proper synergy or their competition's too stiff or the value they add is just not yeah it's just not as good as their competition so this card dead drop i love this card this card fits in slay decks ebonheart slay deck is i run three copies in this in this deck why do I think this card's amazing? Well, Archer's Gambit is a three-costed card that sometimes kills one thing. Sometimes kills two. But Dead Drop is another activator. It's very similar to Crossbow. It's similar to Archer's Gambit. And it's not just zero cost. It's negative cost. Slay put a completed contract means it's generating you Magicka. It is possible to generate 12 Magicka with this card. 
So this card helps you cheat, cheat, cheat Magicka, basically. But this card's an amazing card. I view, I view this very highly. Um, Brotherhood Suspect. Uh, how do we view this card off the top of our head? I do get scared when I see someone play this against me. As a control player, I play... I play all kinds of decks, not just control, but recently I've been mainly playing control. And so when I see people start playing this card, I get a little scared. The reason I get a little scared is because my decks are a little bit on the slow side. This one, this card's not even dead to Ice Storm. And uh, in the right decks, Empire Aggro, Halalu, this card's terrifying. It's monster. It's probably the strongest added one drop in the game because it has a negative last cast. That sometimes never comes into effect. So I'm pretty terrified of this card. I'd say this card is very good, very playable. Uh, yeah, so we're just going over. Dust Eater Skirmisher. When Dust Eater Skirmisher takes damage from a creature, give that creature maybe one, maybe one. Hmm. I wouldn't have thought much of this card in the past, but um, we played in a tournament today, and we lost to this card. Goblins are scary. Scout aggro goblins loves this guy. Because this card is a competitive one drop. It is a very competitive one drop. It's not a bad one drop. Aggressive. Very aggressive. Um... So, uh, the, the dangerous thing about this card, first of all, he's a goblin. And there's this four-drop goblin that says, all goblins get plus two, plus two. And when people play this card, they're playing that goblin. So, this guy can become a four-three as a one-drop. And uh, he trades really well into two drops. He hurts as a one-drop. And synergizes with the Bloody Hand Chef. So, in Scout... Scout aggressive tempo lists dust eater skirmisher he's a murderer this guy kills people so he's a good card ah bloody hand chef bloody hand chef two drop when you reduce an enemy creature's power or health with an effect bloody hand chef gets that much power or health um Anyone who's played Jaws of Oblivion versus people who play this will have seen a large bloody hand chef. I've seen this guy go to 8 8, 9 9. I've heard, I've seen pictures of it go to 20 20. Like this card, this two drop can become a 20 20. I'll give you an example. If a player uses a debilitate on a full conscription board and has this on the board, 8 minus two minus two that's minus 16 minus 16 this becomes a my this becomes a plus 16 plus 16. this becomes an 18 18. if this card plays with a debilitate on a conscription board granted you actually can't play this and then debilitate without first buffing it one if you do not buff this card up this would die by the debilitate but that's easy because these decks you run curse and they were run Murkwater Skirts. They curse the target first, buff it to 3 3, use Debilitate, smack everything down. Now it's at 18 18 as a 2 drop. Terrifying. This card goes into the field lane. Anything that goes in front of it dies because, again, it synergizes with the goblins. It gets the plus 2 plus 2. These guys run so many curses. The amount of pressure the Bloody Hand Chef can exert. It's tremendous. It's a tricky to drop, and I would say that um, I was very thankful that when we achieved top 10 on Halloween, it was against this card. In fact, we had played against, on the very last day of the season, we had played against Scout, I will call him Curse Scout Aggro, Curse Scout Aggro many times, and I, I called them the Goblins from Hell, and I played against them many times, and I lost to them many times. 
But uh, when it mattered the most, we finally beat them right to get top 10. But Bloody Hand Chef was a monster. As an example, the board state before I won was turn five. They had a 4-4, four, four, a 4-4, four, four, a 4-3, and a 4-3. They had four creatures with four attack on turn five staring at me. That's why I believe God gave me that win. That's literally the perfect board. That's a Mournhold Trader. That's a Bloody Hand Chef. That's like Goblin Dude. There are so many... There's a lot of dangerous cards in that deck. And it was impressive how we were able to deal with it. We had Curse Curse because we were very conservative with our curses. We had a Murkwater Scourge. So we had two curses in an Ice Storm and a Ring Charge. Bam. Win. But Bloody Hand Chef deserves his name because he cooks his enemies. A uh, wild boar. One three. Wild boar can't gain cover. The start of your turn, wild boar moves and gains plus one plus zero. One three. Can't say I've seen a lot of this card in constructed. I think I've only seen one person dare bring it in a monk deck, a movement monk deck, which um makes kind of sense considering there's a card in there that makes every creature that moves get plus one plus one so if wild boar moves he's at two three becomes a three four so this is not a bad card in movement monk i don't think it's been explored as much as it could be because movement monk is kind of less popular than control monk wax wayne hello control monk by the way if you're just tuning in we're we're at the preview stage so we're going quickly apparently through all of the cards and our version of quickly is very slow so this card probably is very good in aggressive monk licks think of those monk cards that that, that, that guy that moves up and down lanes uh, apex predator this is an apex predator kind of two drop card in that deck i mean it technically is a two three on the second turn it's on his first turn so like that means it's a one three that can't hide so it's worst case scenario is basically it's literally this piggy very tasty or well, one three two drops horrible when the one drop we just looked at is a two four that's a two four so this looks pretty bad and it's weak if it's not put in a lane where you already have control of that lane but once you start synergizing with those movement abilities the very fact it moves on its own is kind of unique. I don't think there's other cards. Apex Predator does, but not every single turn. So, I would put a question mark on this card. I think I think this card could be explored more. And we're speaking about constructive mainly. Willow Wisp, three two drain. I I've seen one deck really make good use of this Ebonheart Conscription Rage Ebonheart usually when people think of Conscription they think of Telvanni Telvanni probably has the strongest Conscription game. Now you're looking at Redrin with its hand buff Empire also has pretty good Conscription Dominion has Conscription as well Ebonheart sometimes gets overlooked and uh, probably wrongfully so. So like Ebernard Conscription's better than it gets credit for. Now the strategy behind an Ebernard Conscription deck is you run a bunch of two drops for your Tully's Conscription and you just don't want to die. And then you're going to thin your deck out, put so many creatures in your grave, find your Flesh Antronach, throw on a weapon, and Unstoppable Rage them. So you have like 20 creatures, 30 creatures in your grave, probably 20 creatures in your grave, you could have a 26 26 attacks flesh hatred knock. You don't even need it that strong, honestly. Because if a flesh hatred knock even has 20 attack and it rages in front of two creatures, that's a dead person. So Will O Wisp finds a good home in this place because it's second Barrow Stalker. So Barrow Stalker is seen as like a top tier two drop for conscription decks like Telvani. It's like considered the staple must have alongside Skinned Hounds. The idea behind a Will-O-Wisp 
Skinned Hound, Barrowstalker. These are the cards that start slotting into that Ebonheart Conscription deck just so they don't die. So Ebonheart Conscription has a little bit difficult, some difficulties compared to Telvanni. Telvanni has Ice Storm. This Ebonheart Conscription has a cool combo, good finisher, but it just needs to not die. Like it just needs to not die. If it just doesn't die, it will get there. And it has, mo there's multiple variations. There are variations that have Pure Blood Elder as an example, as opposed to Flesh Hydronok. And uh, I think Will-O-Wisp's stat line is good. I think guard is sometimes a relevant keyword, and it's sometimes not what you want. And in uh, a deck that runs Skinned Hounds, Barrow Stalkers, and Will-O-Wisp, this fits in slots in very, very good, very well. And I think, um, I think it's a good card. Arenthia Gorilla. Three drop three four lethal on your opponent's turn. Can't say I've seen anyone play this card. Now, as a three drop three four, it's starting to look a lot like a discerning thief. Now its ability basically says, "Touch me if you dare. I kill you if you touch me on your turn." Is this card really... So we want to be reserved on judgment on whether it's good or bad. First of all, it's playable. A 3-drop three 3-4 three is playable. Sometimes your Discerning Thief never pilfers, and it's just fighting as a 3-4. Same thing with your Grey Viper Brigands. 3-drop three 3-4. Three it's a 3-drop three 3-4. Three anything else it does is like extra kind of deal. There's a lot of situations where that is. So from a baseline playability standpoint, it's at least on par with its contemporaries, its competitors. Now the problem with lethal on your opponent's turn is this disincentivizes people to trade down on this. They can't take a larger creature to trade into it without dying. So the card, the card could be good. Now the question is, is this for aggressive? Is it a mid-range? Is it a controlled card? Like, who wants this card? I think that's the main reason why it's not see play. Is, is there's a confusion with like, where is this card going? So, Mile will put a question mark in. We'll come back as we do our uh, more thorough review on it. Three drop, Bitter, bitter Fish Witch, Goblin 2-2 two, two, Prophecy, give a creature negative one, negative one. <sighs> he is expensive. He is expensive. Now, even though he is expensive, though, he kind of, he is one of those cards that is good not because he's just good, but it's because Dust Eater, Skirmisher, Bloody Hand Chef, this deck archetype is being pushed very heavily. And he's he's got the two things you want. He's a goblin, and he gives minus one, minus one. As a goblin, he gets the plus two, plus two buff from the goblin that gives plus two, plus two to all goblins. Very important. Like, that turns this guy into eh, to eh. Wow, I'm almost dead. That's like Bitterfish which so it's funny too that he's a prophecy because the deck that wants to run this is mainly an aggressive scout list that honestly just wants to race so i don't think prophecy matters that much for this deck because usually they're just trying to kill you first but it's a it's a it's like a nice to have but it's not really scout isn't high that's this goblin scout deck's not high density in prophecy so it's not really reliable and I just feel like you're overpaying it. You're okay, you overpay for this card if you do not buff it with the plus two plus two. And if you do not buff a bloody hand chef. So it's certainly overpaying. It's like an expensive Murkwater Witch. This guy's the the bougie Murkwater Witch. Okay. That's exactly what he is. Until 
he gets buffed. Once he gets buffed, he's worth it. He's a young mammoth. If three magicka, plus two, plus two, he's a young mammoth already. And then if he gives the minus one, minus one, and it dictates a trade and bu buffs a blade hand chef, he becomes better than a young mammoth. So I think the trick with B Bitterfish Witch is he's not so good by himself. But because of the Goblin synergies, because of the Bloody Hand Chef synergies, it's possible in that deck to squeeze more value out of him than you would out of a normal 3-drop. So that's what you're looking for in Bitterfish Witch. This card is a card that you're trying to squeeze as much value out of. And when you squeeze the maximum amount of value, it's enough to win. That's the key. So I think he's, he will find a home in that deck, because that deck's actually very viable, very competitive. So it's a very, it's a, so this card's not good, but it's scary. So it's like, it's not good by itself, but it's scary in that deck. Like it has to be respected. Like that deck is basically just look what, like that deck, if it didn't have this option, it's just looking to stuff it in with random stuff. And if I'm not mistaken, these aggressive goblin aggro decks, they cut young mammoths to put in this card. Like they don't. I've, if I've ran against enough of them, I don't even think they have young mammoths or bleak host trolls, which is incredible. Like to think that an aggressive deck doesn't need young mammoths and can still wreck people. That it's intense. Mountain lion. I've been seeing a lot of mountain lion. Mountain lion. When I see this, this is the kind of card I don't play, and this is the kind of card people play against me all the time. Like, when I see this card, I'm like, I'd rather play an Onde Clan Sorcerer. Like, Onde Clan Sorcerer is my favorite card. It's the same stat line, 3 Magic of 4 3. But then it's so fun. Like, you've got the depths. There's so much mini game of, like, did I kill three things this turn? Did three things die this turn? And, ooh, there's RNG. I got a Blood This is like, none of that RNG. You know exactly what you're getting. You get 4 3, and you get 1 Magic. There's no tricks about this. There's nothing tricky about it. There's nothing random about it. So it doesn't look fun to me compared to Onda Clan Sorcerer. But the reality is it's actually better than Onda Clan Sorcerer in many situations. Because in many situations, Onda, like in the most desperate situa situations, Onda Clan Sorcerer is thrown as a 3-drop 4-3 four, three in front of harm's way. Like literally, they put a Mournhold Trader and we didn't put a put one drop, we didn't have a two drop, so now we're forced to put our Onda Clan Sorcerer in front of the Mournhold Trader and pray they don't have Shadow Shift, because if they do, or Wardcraft or something like that, which they usually do, <laughs> that is why Mountain Lion is probably better than Onda Clan Sorcerer in every single one of those situations where Onda Clan Sorcerer is never generating any blood magic spells, which is a lot. There are many situations where Onda Clan Sorcerer is just a body. Now, I've seen people play this card as their turn 3 play and still win without even using their Magicka. So, sometimes you think of a Mountain Lion, you think, summon, gain one Magicka. In order for this card to be good, it needs its Magicka to be used, right? Otherwise, it's objectively worse than a Young Mammoth, right? Like, a Young Mammoth's a 4-4 breakthrough. If you're just gaining one Magicka and you're not using it for anything... This is worse than a young mammoth. Makes sense. If a mountain lion fought a young mammoth, the mountain lion probably would die. Unless the mountain lion was some kind of hero mountain lion. So this this card to me. It's a very clear tell. The moment someone plays it, you know they have one plan. Kill you very fast. That's all that's all that's all it is. The, the plan is to kill you very fast. So you there's no tricks about it. They're here to kill you. And if they play this card and they don't have one drop in their hand. That's great, because if it had a one drop in your hand, you're probably going to lose. So, I think when Mountain Lion generates the tempo to put on something like a Brotherhood uh, brotherhood Suspect, if it's able to like put this on the board too, it can be too much. It can be too much for a deck that, or a Crown Quartermaster, something like that. And this is the, that's the idea of Mountain Lion. It's, it's a tempo play. It's like a mini Nyx Ox to just overwhelm your opponents as fast as possible. So, I wouldn't call this card particularly good, but I think it has to be respected. It's scary. 
it's scary for every player who sees this knows that it's like okay fight to survive and if you get past like turn five and you're at a healthy life total you won the game first mountain lion decks I think the best home for this card is, um, we shouldn't, I think we should know, I think Beast Cat has animals. Let's cat, let's just check it out, let's check it out right now. It does, okay. I should mention then, uh, Beast, an, Beast Cat has animals, and animal decks, wow, that's a lot of them, that's a huge host. Hello, hello Sir Prook. Hi, how are you? We are just, uh, chilling, reviewing our set. Uh, we're just previewing, going through the cards of Jaws of Oblivion, Oblivion Agility. We're going, we're trying to go through the, the cards quickly, and then we're going to go over them in a little bit more depth. So, animal decks are a thing. Like, if you open it up, and you look at how many animals are in the game, you start to notice... There's a fair bit of animals. And, uh, like, Snowy Saber Cat, right? And this card, Shadow Green Elder, plus two, plus two to animals. I think this deck was lacking a lot of cards, needed a little bit more support. Uh, it could be played in mono green. I have certainly lost to mono green um, animals my tip for you if you're if you want to play a mono green deck like animal deck like mud crabs I think wilds incarnates are animals they are if you're going to play an be sure by if you're running an animal deck put in your reflective automatons if you need it because these count as animals so they get the plus two plus two buff but the thing about so yellow purple scout scout yellow purple seems okay because it gets young mammoths. But if you are planning on running a mono green deck or mono anything deck, I would say put in at least one multicolor card in your in your deck, just one. Like if you're playing if you're playing uh, mono green, why don't you just splash in one scout report? The reason is at least, or even one, one black hand messenger. The, the rationale behind that is, you don't want your opponent to see that you're a monocolor deck. Put in Martin Sempton. He's a good card. So like he can, he can fall into a, an animal deck. Or if you're really mono green, why not just have one Anasi, right? So, whenever you're a monocolor deck, don't be afraid to put in one card that is multicolor just to throw off your opponent. So they can't tell from the beginning opening a hand, oh, it's just green. Like if you're playing a mono green animal deck and your colors are scout, you'll actually realize you'll have players who are on the other side of the table, like Tribunal or Talani, who have Ice Storm in their opening hand and they'll mulligan it away because they saw scout. If they saw mono green, they would kept they have kept it. Like if they see scout, oh, I need to get my merchant's camel. So you have a fighter's guild recruit in their hand, they'll throw it away. But if you put uh, mono green, they'll know something's fishy because mono green is like a, like mono green screams aggression. <laughs> okay, unicorn. That's a great. That's a great. Uh, um, I missed that off-brand human. Crab Scription is be the best animal deck. I would I'd recommend that as well. The new old salties salt with the mud crabs. It all these are all animals. So if you actually played Spriggan, all those crabs would get plus two plus two. It's a, it's a little bit underexplored, and it actually might help synergize with a uh, mountain lion because mountain lion cards like this they want more card draw. Really, what they really want is more card draw, and. A card like this would love Mudcrab Merchant to be that one drop. You play Mountain Lion, you then play Mudcrab Merchant. So now you know you're not running out of cards. Not only are you not running out of cards, 
you're actually putting crap in their hands. So when you break their runes, it is a real problem. When, you, when your opponent gets their hand filled with things with mud crabs, and they just can't even like they can't, like, they can't even draw cards because they're at like ten cards, for example, and you're forcibly milling their cards but breaking their runes fast enough. That's where these kind of decks shine a lot. So mountain crab, mountain lion, with the mud crab merchant, with the crab scriptions, with the wilds incarnate, your corner club gamblers, you start to make a good use of the tempo you generate by converting tempo into value. A right, unicorn. So we we have never played this card in constructed. Yeah, we have three of them. So we we plan on doing this in the future. So again, we're just sharing our first our first impressions of these cards. So Unicorn, 3-drop, 2-3, three three friendly creatures in this lane with less power than Unicorn have charge. Right, this is a card. Ooh, the leaves look really cool, by the way. This is a card that takes work. Like, this card will not shine automatically. Like, you have to be a little creative with your deck building, but this counts as an animal um, something interesting about this card unicorn is it technically likes items because if you slapped on like a steel scimitar three drop three attack creatures can start to charge if you put on if you put in you know the the assassin card sentinel reclaimer you slapped on the plus three damage all of a sudden all your basically everything in your deck can charge if you put a Sentinel Reclaimer's plus three sword on this thing, it's a five three. So everything with four attack is going to charge, including your mountain lions, which doesn't sound that impossible or improbable. Uh, again, cards like these might be a little bit underestimated simply because not too many people will actually be willing to try this card out because like this is the kind of card that says non-unique legendary to really shine you need a deck built to take it around it to take advantage of it and to do that you're going to need three and because it's not proven to be good most people won't craft three including myself because they have a long list of other legendaries they'd rather craft that they know would be good versus Unicorn is like, um, maybe good, maybe bad. So Unicorn definitely fits that question mark of not yet sure how good it is, but I think it is a pretty good card. It just needs um, someone, it needs a dedicated deck built around it. It needs someone to try it first of all, and have three of copies, and to be willing to experiment and reiterate, because this deck would probably be an animal deck, might be an assassin deck with the Sentinel Reclaimers, with the Crown Quartermasters. I feel like those are more consistent than red, because like red has items too, but the red item generators aren't as good. Maybe Satanin, like Satanin Courier, slap on plus three plus zero. These these cards might even be in, in the same deck. And something cool, at least about Unicorn to me, thematically, is that Unicorn, when played, when played in the field lane, let's say you're playing this in the field lane, right? Note it gives only creatures in the lane charge, not the other lane. It creates a situation where the Unicorn is bait. It just looks like a juicy 2-3 that's going to make so many things have charge. So you're assuming no one executed it yet your opponents are kind of like chasing after the unicorn like i can see people playing things into the lane that the unicorn is just like in our uh, sort of mythologies of unicorns unicorns are like a hunted animal they're a magical creature with a magical horn that can heal people so people are always chasing and hunting it down right so i can see that happening in games and then the unicorn just tricking the trades with items like slapping on items now Blue items tend to be pretty aggressive as an attack only, so that becomes a little issue because... But maybe there's like Ward Crafters, maybe there's Cloud Resolutionists, different ways to basically protect the Unicorn and uh, keep her alive become an interesting uh, 
little metagame. All right. Blades Flanker. 4-3, give a creature the other lane. Plus 2, plus 0. So this card I don't feel is very good. Mainly because... Uh, In Elder Scrolls Legends, there's two lanes, and you usually want to be able to know control which lanes you're putting things in. This creature, this card kind of forces you to split lanes, and there are many situations where you do not want to split lanes. So, like if you're behind, if you're behind, and like if you're behind your opponent in life, and you're trying to contest them, this card is probably not the right tool because he's deploy to get maximum value out of him you're deploying him in a lane you're deploying him potentially in a lane that's empty or you're deploying him in a lane that is dangerous and the creature that you're buffing is empty and when you compare it to the blade the mountain line mountain line basically reads i'm a two magic car i'm a two drop four three that's actually one way to look at mountain line is by getting one magic here it's a two two drop four three this is double the price because a four is two times two, and it's for stats. It's the same thing, unless you buff it. And whatever you're buffing is probably a three drop, so you're buffing maybe a three four into a five four. So I think I think the problem with this in constructed is it just doesn't naturally say, "Hey, I'm an aggressive player. I want it." It doesn't naturally say, hey, I'm a mid-range player, I want it, I'm a control, but like, all these different decks are not really looking to this kind of card. I mean, Sexy Hive Defender and Hive Defender are four drops. Three six guard is like, if you're trying to defend yourself, a three six guard is better than a four three conditional that needs another creature on the board. Uh, sexy Hive Defender, three six drain breakthrough, way more resilient this double the toughness with the relevant keyword to survive i think the four drop slots very uh heated like there's a lot of good four drops in this game so that really causes problems for him as well I should say her. her as well. So Blade Stalwart, Breton 3-5, Slay Blade Stalwart gains power equal to health. So Blade Stalwart gains power equal to her health. So she's at 3-5. I played her once, and she became a 12 attack creature. And the one time I played her. So she's a little bit worse than a Hive Defender. As a 4 drop, she's a little bit worse than a Hive Defender, because a Hive Defender 3-6 has guard. And uh, her Slay ability basically says... The less damage you take, if you trade into a creature, you get buffer. So Brotherhood Sanctuary is how I got her to 12 attack. Is like, she killed something, got plus 8 attack. She killed something with like, oh, there were two Brotherhood Sanctuaries. She killed a Bear Stalker. So Bear Stalker did 2 damage to her. So she had 3. She got 6. So she, oh, she was 9. In that game, she had 9 attack. She became a 9-3, killing a Barrow Stalker with two Brotherhood Sanctuaries. So... She's a fun card. I'm a big fan of Slay decks. She's not so bad that you can't play her, but she's not... She's not exactly... Is that exactly what you need? 
in those kind of in the in the Ebonheart Slay decks. She's kind of uh, like she requires you to trade into something, kill it, and then take another turn to become buff, and then maybe kill another thing. Because if you start going face with Slay decks too early. You're going to um, deviate from your natural game plan. Slay decks, generally speaking, are more on the defensive and simply trying to generate a critical mass of resources using Brotherhood Sanctuaries, using Forks of Population, using Lucians, using Torval Extortionists. You're waiting to get a big slay. sort of um, windfall and uh, when she gets jacked even if she gets to nine attack that's not enough to finish your opponent basically and uh, many slay lethal slay creatures have lethal which makes which makes m more attack not necessarily uh, Necessary like if you have 10 attack and you're attacking something with three health It's not necessary. If you don't have breakthrough. It doesn't really matter if uh, you're not And if the, if the uh, damage is not sufficient to kill them It's also becomes a question. Well, I have a 10 attack creature Should I swing at them because if you swing at them, maybe your prophecy comes up Another deck that might try this card and with more success might be Halalu Slay. Maybe, maybe there's a world where this synergizes in a Halalu Slay deck. Because Halalu Slay is less about lethal and more about Slay. And uh, this card could be put in the Shadow Lane. And a 5 toughness means it's, it's not going to die to the lightning bolt. And because she's four magicka with she could actually be played with unstoppable rage. So she could actually be played and another thing is if she is hiding in the shadow lane already, she or she's in the field lane as example. Halalu Slay likes to put this kind of card in a lane and use shadow shift, move her from one lane to another lane. She's kind of big enough where she won't die exactly immediately. So she's not executable. She's not lightning boltable. Channeled Storm needs a little work to get to her. And this um, makes it possible for her to be the finisher of Hal Halalu Rage deck. If she's shadow shifted into a shadow lane, Crusader's Assault's used on her and she uses Rage and then she kills three things. Or four things. If she get, kills four things, she gets plus 20, plus 20. Sorry, plus, yeah, plus 20, zero. So if she uses Unstoppable Rage with Crusader's Assault and somehow killed four creatures, she'd get plus five attack times four. What, five attack per creature? So then she becomes a 20 attack, 25 attack creature because uh, Crusader's Assault would have put her at five attack. The Slay would give her a 20 and if you had a Brotherhood Sanctuary, she could have become plus 40 attack. So I am thinking now to myself, Blade Stalwart is a much is much more suitable to the Halalu style of Rage. And um, because of she does have finisher finisher potential in this kind of deck. So again, if she had a Brotherhood Sanctuary, she used Rage killed everything in the shadow lane um she would get plus 40 attack so then she could kill someone in one hit so i think i think this this card's there's a little bit more that, that meets the eye i'd like to see uh, myself try that okay gray fox summon draw a card from your opponent's discard pile pilfer reveal a random unrevealed card from your opponent's hand Five magic of five five. And um, 
for some reason, people found it very touching. The gray fox doesn't have a type. So the gray fox could be a Khajiit, could be a human, could be a mud crab. Could be a red guard. Uh, I want to say, first of all, that Gray Fox has had a, a very high win rate against my decks. Like this card, didn't matter who played it, Talvani, Monk, Monk Control, Talvani Singleton, Assassin. Decks that have like reanimator abilities, like I, I have been playing reanimate. I've been playing a lot of Merchant Camels decks. I've been dumping good things in my deck. Great, I play a lot of top end recently. So the Gray Fox drawing my Lanith, drawing my Odaving, like sometimes tur turns into some weird situations. Draw my Parthenax, which it turns weird situations where your opponent's like top decking. You almost have the game under control, and Gray Fox just takes a card that is really good. Mm, so I think my experience against Gray Fox is colored by the fact I've lost to Gray Fox many times. So I've seen it played a lot and I've seen it the draw a, a card from your opponent's discard pile pretty much is like it's a very good card because you if your opponent's running good cards it means you draw good cards. Now, if your opponent's an aggro deck and they don't have very good cards to draw, then it's not that good. So it's probably much, much better against control decks that have a lot of top end and worse against decks that are uh, a little bit lower to the ground. I don't think the pilfer ability is really relevant. But I think the draw card of your choice is. So if we look at lights. So if we just draw. So, Gray Fox and Faded Wraith are the only cards that draw cards at 5. That draw, that is Jaws. Alright, just kidding. There's a lot more than that. Science Shadow. Aaron. It's certainly the card that I'm looking for, so I do not have a Gray Fox yet. So Gray Fox is certainly a card I'm, I'm, it's very high on my radar. Just be careful though, right? If a card is good in some games, doesn't mean it's good in all games. So if Gray Fox is good against my Telfani's list, it might be very bad against someone else's aggressive list. Maybe they're aggr aggressive Telfani list. There are aggressive Telfani lists. So just be careful of ever thinking a card is always good. Sometimes a card is not good and you shouldn't play it. So you need to look at your hand and figure out, okay, what's my best play? And a card like Gray Fox sometimes wins the game, sometimes cannot be played at all. So in deck building, I think something that players should be careful of is just building based off rarity. The idea that, oh, Gray Fox is a rare card, therefore it's better than non-rare cards. And basically stuffing their deck full of all the legendary cards they can, that's dangerous. So, like, when you're building a deck, I would say if you're putting Gray Fox in, make sure you're taking something out that is either 5 Magicka or more expensive than it. So if you have a deck that's pretty good, and you want to make room for the Great Fox. Look at what's in the deck and then try to take something that is equal to or greater than in cost, not not less. And then the deck will at least perform for sure better than what it was, right? If you put it in and you replace a cheaper card, you're actually 
artificially, you're actually increasing the curve and you're making it, your average cost of your cards more expensive. And it could, um, it could hurt your deck's performance. So Fresh Start is a card that I, I really like. Six drop, draw three cards. When there's a deck that can run Fresh Start, I put in three. Now Fresh Start is 100% worse than Faded Wraith. Faded Wraith is a five magic a card that says, draw one to 10 cards. It's a five magic a card that draws one to 10 cards. And when he draws three cards, Faded Wraith is a 3-8. So it's five Magicka draw three cards and develop a 3-8 body. So Fresh Start is always worse than Faded Wraith, pretty much. It's pretty much always worse than Faded Wraith. So, so, so Faded Wraith is probably the best card. Is It's the best card for sure in the Jaws of Oblivion Endurance package in purple. Um, whether it's the best card of the entire set, we haven't. It's definitely in contention. But Fresh Start is worse than Faded Wraith because it doesn't develop a body. It just draws three. Now, the, the way I like to think of Fresh Start is it's three Thieves Guild Recruits. Thieves Guild Recruits, two Magic a Draw card. Fresh Start is basically playing three Thieves Guild Recruits at once but not developing three one twos that can later be Uprising or Necromancer back. That's the caveat. So it's like you are compacting in the, the, the Thieves Guild recruits, but you lose some of the side effects. Like having residual Fighters Guild, Thieves Guild recruits in lanes helps trigger Leaf Lurkers. It helps, uh, it generates an Uprising threat. It, it creates bodies for our journey and Necromancers to bring back. So, for me, Fresh Start really shines in in decks that can stabilize and they just need to refuel. So, like Ebonheart Slay, as an example, can stabilize by using Unstoppable Rage, using Red Year, using uh, it uses all kinds of cards. You can use many cards in one turn, Torval Extortionist, etc. It can empty its hand very fast and stabilize the board and then fall into a situation where it's like, I have no cards left in my hand. And now you're just praying for Thieves Guild recruits who are praying for Merchant Camel into Merchant Camel to Merchant Camel. It's those decks that pray for Merchant Camel to Merchant Camel to Merchant Camel that really like Fresh Start because it's such a relief when you don't need to draw Merchant's Camel to Merchant Camel to win the game. It's just like Fresh Start, you're completely back online. Let's go. This is a card that you're looking to play in two situations when you have uh, nothing's happening. So if you're a deck that's very passive, reactive, and your opponent's not threatening you enough, you, playing Fresh Start in front of their face is a huge demoralizer for your opponent. It's also very good in decks that can ramp using Torval Extortionist, Ebonheart Slay. They can uh, get a Slay proc and get too much Magicka you don't know what to use with it. Um, potentially Ulfric Uprising decks that can use Nixox and generate a lot of cards, a general Magicka. I would say this is a very good card. Always feel good about having it in a deck. But um, if you run this card, make sure your top end is not too heavy. If your top end's too heavy, then you might run into a situation where your opening hand has a 6 drop, a 7 drop, an 8 drop, and your opponents put a Mournhold Trader, a Cornicle Gambler, and you're in trouble. And Fresh Starts don't do anything for you if you already have too many cards and you can't play them. So Fresh Start really synergizes mainly with Conscription decks that can throw out lots of 2 drops on the board. And decks that have plays between turns one through five and just use fresh start as refuel and you could use fresh start then as your top end i was actually playing uh, last season when invade was really strong we played three fresh starts in our ebon heart slay deck it was, it was very successful 
And the idea was Invade loved pass turn six. Like Invade Invade's turn six was literally a pass, which basically meant fresh start was always playable against Invade, which is really interesting in, in itself. Our deck went 46 wins and 18 losses right here. So this deck has three fresh starts. So this is the deck that was playing against Slay. I'm sorry, playing against Invade when it was unlimited bouncing. And it was a monster. Like, we're talking 80, 85% win rate against Invade. Okay, our final card. So we're going to go back after this card, and we're going to talk about the cards again in the worst case scenarios, average case scenario, and then best case scenario. So the ultimate heist action 12 magicka costs three, le three less for each time you've pilfered or drained this turn deal damage to your opponent destroying their front rune steal the card drawn from the rune if it's a prophecy you may play it for free okay this card can kill someone just just know that first of all if your opponent has zero runes zero runes this card deal kills them deal damage to your opponent destroying their front rune if they have no rune to destroy they just instantly lose the game which is definitely the kind of card you like against those control decks that drain themselves back with zero runes left. So there are decks that have, you know, they, they, they're at 60 life and they have zero runes left. Ultimate Heist would instantly kill them. So, second, it's a 12 Magicka cost card, so it's actually playable by anyone who doesn't ramp. So, like, if you're just in a top decking situation and your opponent has zero runes left, has 60 HP, and they're just laughing at you with guards on all the lanes, they just keep passing their turn saying, what you gonna do, what you gonna do, Ultimate Heist can be played from hand without any of the discounting whatsoever. So this card basically does three things. One, it discounts itself. Two, it damages their front rune. Basically, it does five damage. It does five damage. This is like a five damage spell or insta kill. Those are the two things. Instant kills them when there's no runes or just does five damage. When I say does five damage, actually, it can do less. Because if your opponent's at 21 HP and you use this card, they go from 21 to 20. So to maximize the value, you want to go from 20 to 15. So you want to use it in increments of five and not use it when they're just one HP before the next room. So just be careful, there's a range it can do between one and five damage. Now the third thing it does is kind of extra. If it's a prophecy, you may play for free. I don't think this card needs that card ability to really be effective, considering it could be played for free. This card could be played for, played for free if you've pilfer, pilfered four times. And I do not know if Brynjolf counts as two. I do not know if Brynjolf, Pilfers, and Drain count as discount by six. That is uh, something I'm not sure about. I have not played this card. I've only had it played against me. If you look at the card art, that's an Elder Scroll that's about to get stolen from a Blind Moth Priest. So, I would imagine this card is acceptable as a one or two of in certain decks. It's a little bit extra. But there might be some comfort and surprise factors of major issue of this card because people won't expect it in decks that are just able to chip them down the last room. Like with this card in the deck, you could think to yourself, all I need to do is get them to the last room and don't even care about drain. Just like get them to the last, like take, not last room, take out all the runes. That's it. Take out all the runes, they lose. Uh... 
that being said, it's kind of unnecessary. Um, could be a one of. It's a bit of a question mark because I think I think this deck is this card is playable in Pilfer Monk specifically because I used to play some Pilfer Monk, and Pilfer Monk has this it's it's problems not cards like Pilfer Monk has the ability to draw so many cards in its hand, and when it draws it like Pilfer Monk can draw like a monster. Now Pilfer Monk's problem is it sucks against decks with prophecies like Guildsworn like. He just classically just breaks two runes in one swing and relies on double strike to kill people. And sometimes you go all in on like one creature and you hit that javelin prof that prophecy javelin. And even though you have five or six cards left in your hand, you lost so much tempo going face. They have so many cards in their hand. If they're like tribunal, they just stuck a bunch of Draining creatures and guards, Emperor Blades, and they like Dawn's Wrath to you. It's like this card, because of its power, could fit in to a Pilfer Monk deck that already has proven itself able to draw a lot of cards. Because if Pilfer Monk, like the thing is, when you have a card like this in your hand, you want to not, you don't want this to be the only card in your hand. You want to have other plays, you want to have other choices. So Pilfer Monk having so much card draw naturally synergized with its discounting may be able to pull this off because it already has so many cards in the hand so if you can discount this to three magicka or zero magicka it becomes playable alongside um, your other cards in hand all right so Thanks for uh, tuning in so far. If you have questions, feel free to ask. So let's talk about the worst case scenario, the middle average case scenario and the best case scenario of this card. So the worst case scenario So as a zero drop, dead drop, dead drop needs a friendly creature to play this on. And if you don't have any creatures in play, or you have too many of these cards in your hand that are dependent on having creatures, like people play Ebonheart Slight Note, sometimes you draw Archer's Gambit into a nine drop, into a dead drop, into another crossbow. So there's like four unplayable cards. Like, so dead drop does nothing if you can't play it on anything, and in a in a control in Ebonheart Slay decks that would love this card, there is the risk of having an unplayable hand. So this card just can't be played by itself. It it it's a combo piece. It's if it's actually if you have a card that's in play you can't play it till you can attack so it, it has built into this card it needs you to have a card on the board that can attack to do anything otherwise it does nothing and sometimes that can actually be a lot harder than it sounds so, like sometimes you have a four drop rack and venom tongue you put it in the shadow lane you're waiting for turn five so you can use dead drop and they execute it or they um grizzly gourmet you while putting down another threat. So this is the worst case scenario, I think, of this card. It's just having it in your hand and not being able to play it. Now the average case scenario of this card is you do have a creature in play, you can attack, and you play it, and it acts as a shadow shift. Oh, mind you, Dead Drop also has the problem of you need to play it on a creature that can actually kill out the creature. So it's more or less dependent on... It's not completely dependent, but you love to put it on lethal creatures. So 
you need a creature, you need a specific, like if you had a merchant's camel and you use dead drop, that's a creature that can attack. But is there a one toughness creature on the other side of the lane? Is there one toughness creature in front of you? If not, kind of in trouble. So there is that thing, like it needs specifically a creature that can have, has a trade available to it. Now the average case scenario is like, okay, you put enough lethal creatures, you try to mitigate that worst case scenario by putting enough lethal creatures. And now you have like Iraq and Venom Tongues, you have uh, Old Velothi Assassins, you have Fighter Guilds Recruits, and you've play you've positioned yourself in a way that Dead Drop basically says you can attack any lane because you can either attack the lane you're still in or you can attack the other lane. You may, it may move to attack a creature, but you cannot move unless you attack. So an average case scenario is you're going to get one movement and you're going to get a trade and you're going to get a completed contract. So you're basically going to take a lethal creature. Lethal creatures usually have very bad stat lines. It's going to move to the other lane. It's going to trade so they both die and you're going to get a completed contract. I think that's acceptable because um, sometimes that's all you need. There's a mournful trade on the other side. You have a lethal creature. And maybe you'd love to have an Archer's Gambit, but Archer's Gambit's a three of in a 75 card list. So Dead Drop, <laughs> the presence of Dead Drop is that it's another activator that allows you to do Archer's Gambit-like stuff. It's a tool that your slay and lethal creatures can have, and you don't need to keep drawing more cards to find Archer's Gambit. You can use this. It may not be as good as Archer's Gambit in terms of <coughs> Archer's Gambit can kill two targets, but this card is way cheaper than Archer's Gambit because Archer's Gambit's <coughs> three cost. This card is negative one cost if you get one kill off. Get one kill, you get a completed contract. Completed contract can then um, burn for one Magicka. <coughs> now, the best case scenario is something that I'm very excited about. So the best case scenario of this card is you put this on a card, you have a Brotherhood Sanctuary, and you then start using things like Archer's Gambit. So keep in mind, Dead Drop is a Slay card. So if you had a Brotherhood Sanctuary, every time you killed something, you now generate not just one completed contract, but two. So if you had a dead drop on a lethal creature and you used Archer's Gambit, the first thing you killed, you'd get two completed contracts. Now, if you killed a second thing, you'd then get two more. So if you used uh, a Old Velothi Assassin, put dead drop on it, then used Archer's Gambit to kill something in the shadow lane, move to the field lane, trade in, you're going to get four Magicka for doing that, which means you're going to have a negative one cost Archer's Gambit. Now, if you use Dead Drop on a Torval Extortionist or something like that, and you used Unstoppable Rage and killed four things, you would then generate four contracts. If you had uh, Unstoppable Rage and a Brotherhood of Sanctuary, you'd generate eight contracts. You'd generate one contract from Dead Drop per kill then Brotherhood Sanctuary would then give you a second contract. So you can go from, this card can generate eight complete contracts in one rage, which basically means that was a free unstoppable rage if you had the ability to, the, the hand space to um, burn um, completed contracts. And things like completed contracts should not be underestimated because Uh, Ebonheart Slay, decks like this, are very much dependent. They're dependent. They're dependent on ramping or surviving until like an 8 Magicka play. Getting to an 8 Magicka play, Night Shadow into Squish the Wimpy, pretty much seals the deal against aggro decks. So even one completed contract that can help you get there on turn seven or turn six if you have the Ring of Magicka can win the game. So sometimes 
completed contracts don't need to be used the same turn. They're, they they can they, they can be saved up for the next turn to make some crazy plays happen. Maybe a faster unstoppable rage. They're very flexible. My all time record with dead drop is to generate. 12 completed contracts. So, it's possible, as an example, to put two dead drops on a creature. Like, if you had a dead, two, two dead drops, they stack. You could put two dead drops on top of Astrid. Astrid kills something, it gets a contract. Then the first dead drop gives it a contract. Then the second dead drop gives it a third contract. So, all these things stack. So if you had a Brotherhood Sanctuary, and a dead drop and a dead drop on Astrid, you would generate um, six completed contracts per kill. And I say per kill. If you had six completed contracts, like if you had Astrid, dead drop, dead drop, burn all six, use fresh start, use Archer's Gambit, get another six contracts, burn all those, then use a another uh use a um, crossbow get another six you can keep on going so dead drop the sky's the limit with dead drop when it comes to the best case scenario so when we look at the worst case scenario of this card i think the worst case scenario of this card is not that bad the average case scenario is just what the deck is looking for and the best case scenario is wildly is wild so even if this card got on av its average value most of the time that is good if it got the worst case scenario sometimes, you probably lost those games anyway, and those games probably wouldn't happen that often. And the best case scenario is something that can be done. Take some practice. It, the first few times you start using Dead Drop and realizing how many completed contracts this thing can generate you, you're going to accidentally waste Magicka. You're going to waste completed contracts for sure. So the idea is, after you get a hang of it, you start to realize... Whoa, I could use dead drop into a dead drop into draw cards into burn a bunch of contracts into crossbow into draw more cards into burn a card into rage into like it can lead to some crazy plays. All right, Brotherhood Suspect. So, what's the worst case scenario? What's the average case scenario? What's the best case scenario? So the worst case scenario is you play this card on one and then they execute you and they just cash in the completed contract immediately. That's for sure the worst. That has to be the worst case scenario. It's like, it's like you could have played any one drop and get executed and it would have been, it would have been better. Like if it was a certain pawnbroker and you got executed, you didn't give your opponent a completed contract. Now you get executed. So willpower execute would be the worst thing possible I can imagine facing this because it's literally one for. It's a you two for one to yourself because a completed contract is actually worth one magic cost. So if you played a Brotherhood suspect and they executed you, they got a card from it that's worth one magic, cost, right? They technically drew a Brotherhood suspect because because you you played a Brotherhood suspect, they executed it, you lost a card, they lost a card because they played execute, but then they gained one magic in card, which is the same as an execute because an execute is one magic. So it's as if. They didn't use any resources, and you lost a resource. That's the worst case scenario. And I think that is actually a little bit more common than, uh, than Brotherhood Suspect wants. But um, it's very thematic, you know. He is a suspect. Uh, there's a bounty on his head, and he's getting executed, and someone's cashing on the bounty. It's very, very romantic. Now, the average case scenario, honestly, is like there are a lot of decks that aren't willpower and don't have the. They don't have the execute. I think the average case scenario is this Brotherhood Sanctuary suspect will get in two attacks. I think he just he just comes down so fast, gets out two attacks. If he's played on curve, he's scary. But if he's also found to round up the curve, like for example, if he's the third, if he's the turn three play, with a two drop. And they're struggling to deal with your first crown quartermaster. This card is is screaming pressure, pressure, pressure. It's four toughness means it's it's resilient to ice storm. It could trade favorably into a number of things. Probably the buffest one cost card in the game off of stats alone. 
Now, if, he, if this card gets two attacks in, I think its owner is satisfied. But what you really want to do is you hope that Brotherhood's, Brotherhood... Like, what the player who plays Brotherhood Suspect wants is they want this card to never die. They want this card to attack until the opponent's dead. They're, like, the reason why you play this card, as opposed to Crown Quartermaster, is because this thing can't get firebolted. This thing can't... This thing uh, could potentially survive the Wardcrafter. Like, a Wardcrafter played in front of it needs attack two turns... And if this thing attacks once, shadow shifts away. There's like things that you want your Brotherhood Suspect to give you like six damage. If the Brotherhood Suspect gives you six damage, you're okay with yielding a completed contract. If it's giving you less than six damage, you're you're okay with four maybe, but like you really want to be at up north of six. And when you start piling on damage now, the best case scenario, anything above six is best case scenario. Like if this thing attacked three times, unanswered. Six is one-fifth of their HP, and if they couldn't kill your one-drop, their chances are they're struggling to deal with your two and your three. So, hyper-aggressive decks, love, love, love. I think the decks that... I know Assassin runs this kind of card, but I can't help but think Halalu would benefit more than, than Assassin. The reason is because Halalu loves to control the field lane. They love to put the one drop down first. And the one drop down first in field lane is important because Crusaders assault a card. Cards like one drops like this also struggle. Um, they, they have the, the, if you run too many one drops, you could run to a situation where you have no more cards in your hands left. Halalu has gas for days. Now another deck that loves this is Empire Aggro. Empire Aggro loves this because Apprentice Necromancer, let's bring him up. Apprentice Necromancer can bring him back. So, Apprentice Necromancer in Empire uh, Empire Aggro decks can summon a one-cost creature from your discard pile. So if you play this as a 3-drop, you basically generated 5, 7 in stats for 3 Magicka. Because add this guy up with the, the, the Brotherhood suspect, that's 5, 7 in stats for 3 Magicka. Very scary. Apprentice Necromancer, I did not think of it as a great card when it was revealed, but when it was played against me, I realized it was crazy. I mean, he brings back Mud Crab Merchants, brings back Deepwood, uh, Deepwood Trappers, plays back Morai uh, Tong Aspirant. So, Brotherhood... The Brotherhood suspect is just another one on that list of one drops that can come back. And technically, Halalu and Empire have ways to strength brought off this creature up. So another way of another thing about this card is you want to you kind of want people to chase it, and you want to trick the trader. You want them to like be like, okay, it's big. I need to respect it. It's hurting me. It's attacking me. You want to force them into a situation where they have to play things into it. And if you can dictate trades with Cloud Resolutionists, items, Crusader salts, Steel Scimitars. All these kind of things, or uh, mercenary captains, brotherhood sanctuaries, divine fervors. All these things start to add up together to put brotherhood sus to really squeeze all the possible value out of brotherhood suspect and really put him over the top. So to to complement this card the most, the, the aggressive deck needs ways to buff it. It needs lots of card draw. Empire does this by having Wilds Incarnates, Mud Crab Merchants. Um, uh, there are additional synergies with Young Apprentices bringing it back. If it never dies, it, your opponent never got the completed contract. And that's where this card really wants to be. This is Brotherhood Zespic is so good, they can't catch him. I mean, imagine how bad it must feel to use a lightning bolt or a channeled storm on this guy. So, like, if you the moment you have to use a channeled storm on Brotherhood Suspect, it's even challenging because that means you need to stick someone on the board. And if you're sticking someone on the board and it's not in front of the Brotherhood Suspect, that means it's in the shadow lane. If it's in the shadow lane, that means it's not helping out the damage going face. And so, and then you you can get that channeled storm off. But you use a three magic a spell for a one magic card, and that's where you want to be. In card games, you want people to answer 
your cards with more Magicka. If you play a 3-drop, you want them to use a Javelin, that's 5. You play a 1-drop, you want them to use a 2-drop to kill your 1-drop. If you're able to force them to trade a 2 into a 1, like you have a 1-drop, they, they have to use a 2-drop answer. You give them a 1-drop problem, they give them a 2-drop answer. You give them a 5-drop problem, they have to answer with a 6-drop. This is like, if they play Phalanx, you play Phalanx Exemplar, they play Ordernian Necromancer. And they bring back a tree minder. Like the moment your opponent's playing a card that costs more and it's not truly answering what you've presented, that's where you're getting closer and closer to victory. A uh, Dust Eater Skirmisher. Okay, let's take a check on time. We've been. Wow, we are at. Uh, oh, okay. Dust Eater Skirmisher, one drop, two, one. So, we already talked a lot about this card's Goblin Synergies. So basically, this card is scary because because it's part of it. This card Everything about this card is pretty good. First of all, its one toughness is almost irrelevant because it's just an aggressive card. If it was one toughness or three toughness, it wouldn't even matter because you'd still die to Ice Storm. So technically, if it was a two drop with two threes toughness, it's worse because it costs more. You'd rather have this card cheaper so you can get it down on the board faster and not you don't even care about Ice Storm because you, 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 you accept if they have Ice Storm, you lose. You don't have Ice Storm, they lose. That's this kind of card. And if it had three toughness or one, they still die as Ice Storm. So. Now, it's it's a goblin. So it's a goblin. So there's a card in the game that says all goblins get plus two plus two. And this card has been getting more and more powerful. As more goblins have been released in Jaws of Oblivion, this card's efficacy has just gone up and up with every new cards like this whenever you see a card like this you might think it's not very good especially if there's not many goblins in the game but as every new goblin enters the game this card becomes better and better so like murk water skirmishers like been i've been seeing a lot of it because first of all murk water scourge crazy good goblin this card was amazing it's probably one of the best monthly cards ever released since i've started playing and uh the fact that this and this synergize because there's just goblins, it's something huge for um, our friend that we're talking about. So the, the, the real power behind this is as a goblin, what was a 2-1 can become a 4-3. And that's scary. Like a 2-1 becoming a 4-3. If he wasn't answered as a 2-1, and now how are you answering as a 4-3? It goes back to the ice storm problem. Do you have Ice Storm? No Ice Storm, dead. Now, the thing is, the other thing about this is even if, even if this card didn't have Goblin buffing, as a 2-1, as a 1-drop, it's already chipping for competitive damage. It does the same amount of damage as a Brotherhood Suspect, okay? And the thing is, without the downside of giving a contract when it dies, now, if it tries to trade into something, it would kill a Wardcrafter. This kills a Wardcrafter, because a Wardcrafter that breaks Ward killing this gets minus one, minus one. That means even if the Wardcrafter survived from the trade, from the 2 one, two, one it's minus one, minus one will affect it and kill it. A one drop that kills a Wardcrafter is already a good card. Like, Wardcrafter is one of the most feared two drops, right? And Dusk Eater Skirmisher kills it, and it's half the cost. Again, it goes back to that, what we're talking about. Does, you play one drop, your opponent was forced to answer the two drop, this card can kill a two drop as a one drop, and that's not just any two drop, we're talking about one of the best two drops in the game, Wardcrafter, a warded creature. Now, let's say it's not even attacking a ward creature. This thing basically does three damage. So it's basically, in combat, it does three damage. Like, ima I imagine it when, as it's dying, he like bites his opponent 
That's like that's that's where that extra one damage comes in. The two damage from the axe, but when you kill him, he bites you. So he he, he does. So if he if he fights something, he does three damage, which is taking out things like the. Uh, it's taking out things like corner club gamblers. It's taking out things like the young, the mountain lion. It kill. It's killing things like mountain lions. It's killing things like unicorns. It's killing three drops and. Now, now, now this card's now this guy is basically saying you aren't safe from me if you're warded, and you're not safe from me unless you have four toughness. And if you have four toughness, don't even worry about it. I'll still kill you because my friends have curse. Because this, this guy's the deck he's running has curse. So it's not like so it's like even if you didn't die from Dust Eater Skirmisher, his like dying bite will kill you with a leaf lurker. This is the reality of why Dust Eater Skirmisher. So now let's talk about worst. You know what? That's a scary thing. We were talking about Dust Eater Skirmisher's worst case scenario. Oh, oh that, that, uh, that card? The Goblin? Hi, Siski. Yes, yes, yes. Hi, Siski. Hi, Sarah. I assume you're talking about the plus two, plus two Goblin. If you want to ex explain more, because I'm not one of the old players. I know Goblin Skulk used to be insane because i used to watch some of the older older matches but i'm not sure exactly was that i don't know if that card was cheaper if that card had any different stats i don't know anything about that but okay so you're talking about a card that kills three drops you're talking about a card that kills wardcrafter and i'm telling you we're, we're talking about the worst case scenario of this card that that's actually what we're talking about so like this card is seeing high tier play because it's worst case scenario is good and that's how you know a good card is good it's when it's worst case scenario is good and it's best case scenario is unstoppable so like the worst case scenario of this card is it's a two one on one it does as much damage as this guy if it gets executed just like brother one way of looking at cards like brotherhood suspect and uh, Dust Eater Skirmisher, it just run them through basic tests. Does this pass the Execute test? Does this pass the Ice Storm test? So Execute wise, you don't really care. Because if this card gets executed, it's a one for one. It's an even trade. So if, if I used Execute on this card, the person who plays it doesn't care. Because it means you used Execute not on the Bloody Hand Chef. In fact, maybe they're probably happy that you didn't use it on the Bloody Hand Chef because the Bloody Hand Chef is their real, is their real threat. Ice Storm. Ice Storm comes down five, four to five turns after this card. At which point, if played on curve, this guy is already getting enough damage. Four times two. If he was able to attack nonstop, it's eight to ten damage from a Dust Eater Skirmisher. So if what makes these cursed deck package so dangerous is that they're actually able to keep this guy alive. They can actually get this guy to survive and attack you all the way into the Ice Storm. And we're saying, if you Ice Stormed him five turns later, he did 10 damage to you. So if he stuck around for all that time, you took 10 damage from him. If you had Ring of Magicka, you took eight damage from him. So, the average case scenario is really, he's probably just going to get He's probably just going to get one or two attacks in, and then he's going to trade and keep his next goblin alive. That's that's usually how it plays out. It's like he gets played on curve. Let's just say benefit of doubt. He's played on curve. He's played on curve. He gets his attack in. You put a card in front of him, and he's able to trade and kill it because he's. I mean, what are you playing as a two drop that survives it? And when you you played a barrow stalker, barrow stalker dies to this. The barrow stalker is one of the best in class two drops. So when you look at the card's best case scenario, the best case scenario of this card is just very deep. It, it's not just doing everything we just talked about. It gets buffed by that goblin we mentioned, plus two, plus two to goblin. So this one lingering one drop becomes a four, three. And because of this goblin synergy, it's not even something you're scared to play in mid game, like turn five, turn six, because as a turn five play, let's say turn five play, this is exactly what you want in your hand on turn five, if you have that four drop goblin. Because then you can play this guy and then buff all the goblins that are already on board. So then there's that, that synergy. Now the 
the the second part of what, the best case scenario is when this card finally does die from a creature, it buffs the Bloody Hand Chef. It sets up the Leaf Lurker. So this card is the cannon for the card. So if this card trades into a creature for whatever reason, maybe you, if you have a guard, they'll trade this card into it to Leaf Lurker you. But if you have to trade into it, then they could leave then they can respond to it. The idea is Bloody Hand Chef will become a plus one plus one because of that trade. And it's not very hard for them to just clean up any of these fat guards. Like you say Emperor's Blade, Dust Eater Skirmisher, run into the Emperor's Blade, Leaf Lurker. These are all these kind of things or it's possible if they really desperate could use something like Dust Eater Skirmisher, Run In, Murk Water Scourge, Curse. Now your Emperor's Blade, which is 4 5, becomes a 2 1. A 2 1. A 2 1. Imagine this. An Emperor's Blade, 4 5, gets hit by this, so it takes 3 damage. So it goes to. Um, 3 2. It becomes a 3 2 if it just gets hit by this. Now if you use a curse from a Mark Watch Scourge, your Emperor Blade became a 2-1. And at which point, the curse and the minus one minus one would have turned the Bloody Hand Chef into a 4-4 in front of your Emperor's Blade, who's now a 2-1. Now the, brother, the Bloody Hand Chef could easily trade over your uh, thing. Trade over your, uh, excuse me, trade over your Emperor's Blade. And the Emperor's Blade is like one of the best 4-drops in the game. So one thing that might have kept some, so like one thing that stops the popularity of some, some decks like this, we, we keep mentioning this, is this deck revolves around three bloody hand chefs. Like without three bloody hand chefs, this deck would never be as powerful as it is. So it is one of those cards that someone who has extra soul gems, who's already interested or excited to play goblins, they, they say, I don't, I'm going to put the three Bloody Hand Chefs. Any Goblin deck that didn't have these three Bloody Hand Chefs would automatically be worse because this card is like the center fold of the deck. It's like the Faded Wraith of the Goblin deck. This deck is a Scout Colors, um, green and purple. So Bloody Hand Chef, 2-2. Two, two. When you... Uh, when you reduce an enemy creature's power or health with an effect, Bloody Hand Chef gains that much power or health. What's its worst case scenario? What's its average case scenario? What's its best case scenario? So the worst case scenario is it's a 2-2 two, two, for 2. And you have no way to buff it. In this situation, it is objectively worse than every other 2-drop. Like, like, almost every other 2-drop. So... If this card was played as a two-drop vanilla, no synergy whatsoever. You don't have any curses. You don't have any way to uh, give minus, minus one, minus one. You don't have any way to buff it up. This card dies to the Wardcrafter. Wardcrafter is five. This dies the, to the Barrel Stalker. And the Barrel Stalker survives. So this is how you evaluate two-drops. You just look at a two-drop and you compare it to the best of class two-drops. If you don't know what those are, Wardcrafter has things like... Ward, uh, sorry. Blue has like Wardcrafter. Uh, Bruma Profiteer is for like willpower. Same thing with um, uh, Barrel Stalker for like endurance. Uh, strength has all kinds of two drops. Uh, I'm not sure what it, off the top of my head what is like the best strength two drop. I almost want to say Green Pack Ambusher, but it's like a four one. Prophecy. Okay, so that that's like pretty um, pretty subjective to the situation. It's very situational. That that card's very situational. So, Bloody Hand Chef played without synergy, just worse than everything else. So it's it's worst case scenario. It's it's literally actually worse than the Dust Eater Skirmisher. So like D Dust Eater Skirmisher. Is fifty percent is like fifty percent of the price of the Bloody Hand Chef, and it's better. It's like 
100% better. One more toughness doesn't help. This isn't, doesn't save you from very much. Maybe saves you from a 1-5 um, Guild Sword Revitalizer, but that's like, that's it. So his average case scenario, oh, so another worst case scenario for Bloody Hand Chef is Sorcerer's Negation. Great card. Great card. Turns Bloody Hand Chef into a, a, a bloody chef. He's just a bloody chef. Once you once you sorcerer negate him, he's gone. Like you can make him an eight eight, but if I sorcerer negate you, you're gone. Um, I highly recommend if you see a bloody hand chef, just play it as a two two. Execute him immediately. No hesitation. Don't even wait. Don't wait for it to become a three attack. Don't think that oh it's a three attack. I'm gonna put something in front of it. Don't think that way. This thing just grows way too fast. Kill it! I uh, kill it on sight. This is like anytime you see this and you can, you must. So, but sorcerer negation kind of solves that problem because it's like it doesn't matter how big you grow. We're gonna silence you down to two two, and then boop, you're gone. Deleted. So execute kind of has a window. So like when you look at the bloody hand chef, even ice storm. This card can get out of execute and ice storm range very quickly. Wow, she has a, is that a hairdo or is that a hat? Oh, that's a hat. <laughs> Imagine walking around with that hat, that looks kind of fun. So, execute and ice storm, getting this card out of execute and ice storm range is what the owner of this card is trying to do. Um, anytime you see this card, in the, that range and you have no other way of answering it, it must be answered. Which is a testament to its its power. On average, I think this card becomes a 4-4. Like this, like on average, the decks that run this could easily pump this to 4-4 within one turn. And that is a 4-4-2 drop. That on its first attack could have grown to a 4-4 or 3-3. 3-3, three, three. first attack is a 3-3, three, three. second attack is a 4-4, four, four. then it just keeps on going up. So it's 3-3, 4-4, 5-5, three, three, four, four, five, five. and its low cost is allows the owner to develop additional threats alongside it. So Mournhold Traders, other, other Cliff Racers, like, the problem with Bloody Hand Chef is, like, if it's just growing, and there's a Mournhold Trader now on the board, now there's a Cliff Racer on the board, and you're just not, you're just, like, if you're... This deck can just run over people that rely on creatures. So if you like rely on creatures, not actions, like if you're putting creatures as like uh, to contest them, you always get wrecked because they trick your traits. They just shrink your creatures and they grow their creatures. And once this creature is like 4-4 four, four on average, if it survives past, there's no source negation in hand, now you're starting to roll into the best case scenario situation where it's getting buffed by the goblins. It's plus two, plus two to all goblins. Now it's a six, six. Now, now they use another Murkwater Scourge Curse. It's a seven, seven. So all of a sudden it's a seven, seven. I, I want to say also that we talked about Scout running this. There's actually a Monk deck that runs Monk, Monk Goblins. Um, it's quite good. I think Matt Oblivion was the pioneer in this. And he used Calm. So calm is a calm is a card that uh, minus four to creature. Oh, there's another card minus two. To, there's another card that he used this card harmony. So harmony says give all enemy creatures minus two zero at the end of turn. So if you used harmony with bloody hand chef and there's four creatures, bloody hand chef gets plus eight attack right there. See so all your opponents could you minus two minus zero. Which allows you to trick trades, allows them you to race. If you're against an aggro deck and they got this on them, they are not racing you. So I think this curse deck can actually outrace other aggro decks as well. Using cards like this. And the the the, the strategy behind this harmony goblin is to not rely on chipping people down so much as using swift strikes and monk strikes. Kind of like a combo. So that means 
You uh, even bait your opponents, especially aggro decks, into thinking that they can race you, let them break your runes, and put down a bloody hand chef, use calm, then use monk strike, swift strike, all of a sudden they just went from 30 to 0. So I think that's, these are uh, ways of highlighting what I think are the Bloody Hand Chef's best case scenario. It, it becomes a card that can OTK people. It's a very cheap, affordable piece, and it can grow f seven and up. Now, one last thing that we mentioned earlier is Debilitate. If Bloody Hand Chef is played against Tullius Conscription, if you use Debilitate and hit eight creatures, that's... 8 times 2, that's 16. Bloody Hand Chef would actually get plus 16, plus 16, and become an 18, 18 if Debilitate is played. Now the caveat behind Bloody Hand Chef. Cor correct. Correct. Yes, that is what happens with the Bloody Hand Chef. And off 83. Uh, if a person uses Debilitate with this card, the, the, the thing is you need to set it up. Because if Bloody Hand Chefs are 2-2 two, two and you use Debilitate, it will die. So you need to use some kind of ability to pump up Bloody Hand Chef. Curse. So if you use Curse first to bump Bloody Hand Chef to 3-3, three, three, then you use Debilitate. Debilitate would then give this creature plus 16 plus 16 on a conscription board, making this creature... A 1919 attack. You got plus one plus one from curse, plus sixteen plus sixteen from the from the debilitate, and uh, that's pretty good for a two drop. Now, one of the reasons why you see these cards played in monk and scout is because decks that center around such a powerful card want the consistency of drawing this card more often. More often. If you have a 75 card tricolor deck, you'll see Bloody Hand Chef fewer times than if you had 50 card um, Monk or Scout. So that's why the main that's like the main reason why Bloody Hand Chef is see, seeing play in the 50 and 60 50 card decks. So we're going to speed, try to speed up a little bit, and we might take a little break soon. Wild Boar Beast, 1-3. So I think to re Wild Boar can't gain cover at the start of your turn. Wild Boar moves and gains plus 1, plus 0. I think, so this card I said is a question mark. So what we're talking about is pure theory. I have not seen this truly pulled off. But I think um, the worst case scenario is you put the, you have no lane to put this in. The reason that it's a 1-3 as a 2-drop, which means it's far behind curve. Like... Uh, it's not far behind because technically it's four in stats. If you ever wonder how to like value cards, just add the attack and the defense and just call it four. You get four in stats. So technically a Bloody Hand Chef is four in stats. You play two Magicka, you get four in stats. Brotherhood Sanctuary, you got one Magicka, six in stats. So that's just one metric to look at. So this thing is a two drop get four in stats, which is uh, half of a Mournhold Trader because a Mournhold Trader is eight stats for two. Four attack, four defense. Which means a Mournhold Trader is literally four times attack and one more defense, which is a problem. So that means from an aggression standpoint, Mournhold Trader is way better. So when you look at two drops, you do compare things to Mournhold Trader because Mournhold Trader is a best in class two drop for green, for aggression. For defense, you're looking at Fighters Guild Recruits, has lethal, has guard, can stop pretty much, a Mournhold, can stop a Mournhold Trader. Like Fighters Guild Recruit passes the Mournhold Trader test. Does Wild Boar pass the, the Fighter's Guild Recruit test? No. It can't even kill Fighter's Guild Recruit. If it's played in front of a Fighter's Guild Recruit, Fighter's Guild Recruit will kill him. If you put it in front of a Mornhold Trader, Mornhold Trader will just eat him for breakfast. So Wild, Wild Boar has something about it that's slow off the bat. So this doesn't mean the card's hopeless. It just means that we need to recognize that if this card is to be put into a deck for defense, we must get more value than a Fighter's Guild Recruit. If it's put in for aggression, it needs to get more value than Mournhold Trader. And the main way I... So, so that's the worst case scenario. It just can't fight well. 
and it doesn't get covered, so you can't even hide in the shadow lane. So if they have a creature in the shadow lane and a creature in the field lane, this thing can't actually even be played. It's just very uncomfortable. You're just in a situation where you feel like you're feeding them roast, roast boar. Now, when we look at this card, it's like, okay, let's move away from the worst case scenario. How can we squeeze the most amount of value out of it? Well, in theory, in theory, if this card was played like so in front of these creatures and you couldn't do anything with it yet, that's a problem. But what happens if you have movement cards? What happens if you have the card that says all creatures that move plus one plus one? What if you use um, Grand Ball? What if you use... There are a couple of shenanigan decks that can grow creatures very quickly using the movement package, is what I'm trying to get at. So on curve, you are okay with playing it on curve. This, this could be a turn one play with the Ring of Magicka. This could be a devastating turn one Magicka play. Because you put it in a lane, there's both empty, and you can start buffing it every single time it gets buffed. The next turn, you have two Magicka, you use the plus three, it skips. The first turn, so let's say you put it on turn one. Turn two, you move it, and now it's a, it's a, so first turn, it was a, it became a two, three on, on turn two. You move it, so it becomes a, three four and then on your turn it becomes a four five that's that's the the dream that's like the wild board dream like if this card was played on turn one ring of magicka and then you move it on turn two with the other thing you have a four five on the board and it's not just a four five it's a four five that's going to get it's going to get bigger that means the next turn it's going to become a six five six 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 five four five Six six yes a six six I believe it becomes six six, so this wild boar can become a six six, in three turns. So, while this card may not pass, the execute test, right? It does have the ability to grow bigger than a mortal trader. Now, unfortunately for this card, even though it has this movement package synergy with Apex, Predators, all this kind of stuff, it is a risky card. Like, there, you cannot fool yourself. This card is a risky card. On average, this card probably will live... I, I believe the stats in Elder Scrolls Legend is, on average, a card lives 1.4 turns. I'd have to check it again, but there was, a, this, there was an official statistic on this that and I believe... a. A card's average life cycle is 1.4 turns. And cards like this don't like that because, in theory, it needs more turns to really... It needs three turns, which is more than double the average. And it needs certain pieces to get there. So it's kind of like a moving parts problem where Wild Boar, is, Wild Boar can't get there by himself. Like, he's not good by himself, which is Wardcrafters, Barrow Stalkers, Fighters Guild Recruit, all those cards... They get there by themselves. They're like max. They like they get absolutely beastly value on their own as two drops. While Wild Boar is kind of struggling, and he can he can get more value than those cards, but he needs help. So definitely a fun card. I think he's worth trying out. Um, but he his another weakness in what makes him risky is he's ultimately an aggressive card. He's growing in attack, right? And there's something about this card that it can definitely cheese somebody. I think it can cheese someone, absolutely. But Monk just bursts, bursts his willpower decks with any amount of prophecies, almost always hit a prophecy. That's like what it feels like. It really feels like Monk base decks because they break two runes at once they grow these giant creatures they create excellent javelin targets they create uh, they create really good targets basically they create these oh i deleted my deck but i had such a funny deck i had such a funny monk deck that that 
it was so powerful yet even in its power it would it had it just routine it lost a lot of games just because it just it would get it would always it would it could always almost get there but when you break runes you're actually giving your opponents cards right i like to say if you break five runes you just handed your opponent a card that says zero cost drive draw five cards that's what happens monk pilfer monk movement monk they they their strategy its weakness is it literally does that it literally gives people five cards for free and if they're a prophecy games probably like games can be probably over because of monks sort of the way it just it just overly inv it over invests in threats and wild boar is kind of along that line you're investing a lot into mr piggy So the best case scenario I say is he gets a 6-6 six, six in value, but it takes like three turns. So I think on average, I think on average he's going to survive that 1.4 turns, which means he's going to become a 2-3. And uh, that's not, that's not too good because another best in class card from purple is dragon tail savior and dragon tail savior as a two drop very easily becomes a six three that's it's like dragon tail savior if dragon tail savior is played in front of a lane in four creatures it gets plus one for each creature that becomes plus four of zero it's a six three which is so much easier to do, and you get it immediately. You don't need it, and it can get cover. You don't have to do any like movement. You don't. It doesn't need to wait on. You don't need to wait for your cards to draw. You just need to wait for the situation to play it. And this creature, if it's played in front of a single creature, super easy. I mean, what else are you playing it against? If you're Dragon Tail Saber, you just play it when there's one creature. It's a three-three. It takes two turns for Mister Piggy to get to Dragon Tail Savior's level. So he needs that movement help. Okay. Willow Wisp, two drop, three two train. I think this is a card that uh, really benefits Scout. It benefits the Ebon Hearts conscription decks. Decks that just don't want to die. This, 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 this deck, the decks that use giant bats and suicide them in and feel bad, this is what Will O Wisp is kind of a better replacement. Like, giant bat kind of sucks. Like, if it wasn't for level 3 soul terrors, giant bats would be horrible. You giant bat, even with level 3 soul terrors, giant bat's just not consistent enough. Like, I'm a huge scout fan, and it just, like, soul, soul terror scout with giant bats puts you in a funny situation where if you put word walls in your deck and you don't get your soul tears or if you get your soul tears and you don't get your giant bats it's like we're dying to crab decks like we're dying against people who are like turn five have lethal and like if they have lethal on turn five how is a word wall soul tear you can't even play those cards there's not enough magicka like You'd have had to have a word wall in hand. You have had to have a soul tear in hand and you'd have to find the giant. Like it becomes this like messy situation where I like to build control decks where you have just enough drain, like just enough drain. You don't want too much drain, but you want just, just enough. So the way of looking at drain is I think drain is a useless keyword in the control versus control matchup in many cases. It, and it is uh, exactly what saves you from dying versus certain aggro decks. So when I design a control deck, I like to think to myself, well, I believe if a deck, a control deck was able to win 90% of its games against aggro with one HP, that's a really good deck. Like the less HP you're able to win at consistently with, it actually means that your deck is stronger better designed for the late game. 
So like, let's say you win against aggro decks and you're always winning at full health. It means that your deck is super teched against aggro and you're probably gonna get your butt whooped against control decks because you invested so heavily in drain and stuff like that. And your opponent's control decks are greedier, they have more finishers, more late game, and drain's not a very late game thing. It's just a, just a stabilizer. So when I build control decks, I'm trying to intentionally win with the lowest amount of HP possible. And that's done by just having the right amount of drain. For Ebonheart Slay, that could mean three Night Shadows, three Barrow Stalkers. That, maybe that's enough. Three Night Shadows, three Barrow Stalkers. Maybe that's enough in a 75 card list. Will-O-Wisp kind of adds to that um, repertoire. It adds a new choice. Because sometimes Night Shadow just doesn't come online. Like, really, it doesn't come online. So let's pretend there are people who run um, Unstoppable Rage, Conscription, Ebonheart Slay decks, and they've cut Night Shadow completely because they just feel like it's just not consistent because it's it's a 6-drop with a 6-5 drain, but it gets answered with Javelins. It gets answered with Silence. It, just, it, gets, it gets answered too much, and if you put your eggs in your all your eggs in a basket, like a 6-5, and you get answered, you lose the game. And that's also what Dark Seducer gets cut from so many games. The Dark Seducer is 8 cost creatures, 7-7 seven, seven drain on both turns. It seems like it's amazing, but it's not if you're playing against tier 1 decks that have silence. And if like, if anything, your 7-7 seven, seven, your your seven, seven attack creature just baited you to your own death. Because you, you put your trust in a drain creature that ended up draining you 0 HP. So... There are a lot of times where Barrow Stalker is just way better than uh, the Dark Seducer because Dark Seducer, like you didn't when you're in that situation where it's like they have three cards in their hand and you're looking at lethal and you you play Dark Seducer and you're like oh I just hope he doesn't have silence I just hope he doesn't have Pentasocialized Agent I just hope he I hope he doesn't have an Edict of Azura Aggro decks with crabs run Edict of Azura exactly for these kind of cards. So the thing about Will-O-Wisp is coming down faster, draining just a little is better than draining nothing. That like draining a little is always better than draining nothing. So there are a lot of situations where Will-O-Wisp is way better than Dark Seducer because Will-O-Wisp actually drained you some HP. So the worst case scenario of Will-O-Wisp, I think, is to say, okay, well, what's its stat line? It it is comparable to uh it's actually comparable to a green bruma profiteer because a bruma profiteer is a three two two drop and with drain three if this creature attacks a single time it's the same thing as if bruma profiteer healed you three times with three creatures played so when you just compare bruma profiteer with will-o-wisp there are situations where brumas gives them more life sometimes will-o-wisp gives you more life realistically speaking uh Bruma probably is played usually in the field lane because it's played in the colors that have Crusader's Assaults. Okay. But Will of Wisp is played in the shadow lane because if you're uh, playing a drain creature and you have shadow shifts like this kind of stuff, you're trying to at least get some drain off. And there are times you'll put in the field lane in front of your opponent's creature, but sometimes you'll be afraid of items. What if they had the Brotherhood uh, suspect and they have Steel Scimitar and they just survive the trade, kill your drain creature? It feels bad. So Will of the Wisp is kind of a shadow lane creature for this reason. I think stat wise this card is comparable to best in class. It's comparable. So it's it's good enough. Boom and Profiteer, it's good enough. A drain, super relevant. So decks that um, put this card in can then take out Night Shadows. They can take out Dark Seducers. So the point of putting this card in is to take out those cards because those cards are so unreliable like they've provenly proven to be unreliable and you say well chris don't you need night shadow to use unstoppable rage it's like 14 magicka super cool combo that's a cool cute combo it doesn't happen off that often honestly mostly usually that's not how games are won and the th thing is um there are but there are better choices like with when you put in Will-O-Wisps to take out the Night Shadow, you can then put in things like Pure Blood Elders. Because Pure Blood Elders are 7 Magicka, which means they're cheaper than your Dark Seducers. 
they can become 15-15s, so they become lethal. They are like they become like win condition. So by taking out night shadows, which are barely win conditions to begin with, they're like they're just put in because they're draining, and they might like they kind of half ass. Like honestly, night shadows are half ass. Like half ass on the drain, and they're half ass on the win condition. Like even if you use night shadow on top of rage, it rarely kills people. It can't kill them from full to zero. And as a drain creature, it's just so expensively costed versus all the real competitive decks that actually need a drain against, it is not good enough unless you can squish the Wimpy, unless you've got completed contracts. And if you don't have those things, playing that six drop, like Tribunal's beating the crap out of you in the field lane, you put down Night Shadow, Javelin. You're against Empire Conscription. You're against Thulier. He's already got the mercenary. He's already got the mercenary captain online. It's, it's turn forward. The mercenary captain's online. Already buffed like three or four creatures. Young apprentice Morag Tong. You're already at half HP. You throw down the night shadow. They then use Penitus Oculatus. What are you gonna do? You lost. You just lost right there. So the good news about this card is it's worst case scenario. It's average case scenario, and it's best case scenario, or there's so little variance. Worst case scenario is you played this in field lane, and you got value traded. That kind of sucks. That's actually really bad, right? But you can play around that by putting the shadow lane. But technically, if you got value traded like that, at least Will-O-Wisp stopped damage coming from into your face. Like, if Will-O-Wisp was to be put in the field lane and was to die to Crusader's Assault to get... Uh, wrecked that way at least it stops some damage coming to your face which is exactly what you're trying to do and you don't really care about anything else it, the opposite situation for Ebonheart and Scout is on turn 2 they play nothing they just don't play anything like playing nothing on turn 2 and then your opponent's just attacking your face you start milling cards it's as if so you as if you have t uh, the problem of too many cards you can't play them so slotting in 2 drops to play just starts to, like imagine a game two games you had the exact same plays in one game you played a two drop and the other game you didn't play anything and they're just attack your face that two drop saves you for life could be the difference maker i think on average this card will at least connect once and drain you back life and save you more damage by being killed so like if you put it in the shadow lane and you heal off of one time and then your opponent tries to kill it respond to it it did its job it actually did its job it saved you seven life like when we look at drain it's actually just how much damage did it stop from going to your face drain by draining three life back it's the same thing as broom of profiteer giving you three procs right now if your opponent then has to respect the card and say look I need to kill this will o wisp I can't just let it stay there and keep draining up. Then it's given, it's bought you to precious time. It's bought you another turn, potentially. It could even buy you that turn that you needed, because many times on Ebonheart, you're on turn seven, and you have Squish the Wimpy and Night Shadow in hand. You have the two cards, but you don't have the time. So Will-O-Wisp stalling you out that one turn could get you to that game when you play. Now I think the best case scenario of this card is you put this in the field lane. Your opponent puts a card in front of it. You use Skin Hound and you kill it and you survive the trade. Now you've when you do something like that, just a small little play like that, you put this card in the field lane. Your opponent is forced to respect you. They, they now go to the field lane. They chase you. When you're playing control, you want your opponents to chase you. It, it, it is something that uh, I think I got better at and I, I want to improve at as well, is forcing your opponents to go into the lanes that you want them to go to. Drain creatures have this ability. When playing against aggro, drain creatures force them to leave the cover lane and to go into the field lane. And if you have cards like Skin Hound, maybe they put a three... Maybe, let's say they put a Broom of Profiteer in front of the Will-O-Wisp. They're aggressive deck for whatever reason. They, they did that. 
now you have the ability to maybe use a skinned hound and take now you're getting value out of the drain not only are you draining life you force them to play into your your trick you now got them to come in front of you they didn't expect the skin hound you survived the trade and now they have to play into the field lane again because there's a if there's a willow whisper it's going to drain more life they can't race you on the other lane um, they might lose the race even because you now have five damage developed on the board you have the skin hound and you have the willow wisp but now you have the advantage because willow wisp not only not only is willow wisp uh able to attack into things because it's field lane skin town's there to help out and now it's in the field lane you might have territorial vipers that can come in as kind of like a air cover mind you or you might have the ability of throwing hiss mages you have the ability to change the place and versus aggro decks even mid-range uh, if a control deck is able to just not be almost dead, if you're just like not, if you're just like not dead, you win. So every turn you buy from these kind of small micro plays brings you closer and closer to your win. Especially if you built your deck correctly. If you built your your deck where you have reliable win conditions, eventually, so let's say you just invest so much in the field lane and you're just draining up. If they're a aggressive or a mid range deck, what ends up happening is. In order for them to win, they will need to break your runes. So you don't need to worry about card draw. All you need to do is ramp yourself or survive to the magic point where you can play the cards that are better than their cards. So if you are draining yourself up to... Uh, so so like let's, let's say it's like 8 Magicka. Like you're already at turn 8. You've already 8 max Magicka. They haven't broke a single rune. This has happened before just off of Barrow Stalkers. Like just because of a barrow stalker, it just it just forced them in the field lane, and it just got the ball rolling into this position where they had to put bleak coast trolls in the field lane. Then we territorial vipered them, like these kind of little plays, right? So, if it's at eight magicka already, and your opponent has been playing things in the field lane, and you've consistently forced, so you've forced them onto an even footing, like. When nothing's happening, control versus aggro, control's winning. So, like, if both people keep playing things in the field lane and HP is not moving anywhere, the control player will win because the aggro decks built their curve lower. So, later on, at, like, their deck's not stacked full of eight drops. Their deck is stacked with two drops to five drops. So, by the time uh, it's at eight magicka, they're putting more two drops and five drops. Now you have access to your big boy plays, your Nyx Oxes, your Zivkins your uprisings and uh, once you're at that critical point or that, that turning point at that turn eight if they even start to break the runes it's going to take them three or four turns to kill you and within three to four turns your eight magicka is going to become something like an odivink So that's the best case scenario I kind of find up for Will of the Wisp. Again, a deck that, a deck, I wouldn't necessarily put this in a deck over Barrow Stalker. It's really like, okay, if you built your deck greedy enough where you have Barrow Stalkers and you're looking for more drain and you are shutting, cutting away those top end drain, Will of the Wisp can, can uh, help out and build that redundancy and give you, it's like a second Barrow Stalker in the deck basically. Because there are so many games where you just win if you play. There's so many games versus aggro where if control just played the turn one Barrow Stalker, they won the game. Like think of Prophecy Battle Mage. Like Prophecy Battle Mage is another good example where Prophecy Battle Mage loves to just keep shoving stuff in the shadow lane. A Willow Wisp turn one into the field lane automatically forces them into the field lane. Now you could say, well, some some Battle Mage players would just race you anyway. They would just say, well, if he breaks my runes, I'll get free prophecies. That's possible, but ultimately Willow Wisp played on turn one versus Prophecy Battle Mage, or or Barrow Sucker. These things just wins the game. It just can win the game by itself. Okay, so we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Thanks for tuning in. You're always welcome to ask questions. Uh, it looks like we are on track to. Uh, take our usual three hours 
to review a set. We're at 2 hours 15. And if we sound angry, we're not. Our voice is kind of dry. All right, so we're back. So we have some... Oh, I think I sound angry to myself. <laughs> My voice does not sound... Hi, how's your... It does not sound like that right now. I sound like I'm... To me, it sounds like I'm making fun of Dark Seducer. But Dark Seducer has really let me down so many times that I really believe that a card like Will-O-The-Wisp should net like... It's easy to think, like a, a, a newer player might think a Will of the Wisp is no match for a Dark Seducer. And that's true if they were fighting, but that's not what it's about. It's about how close, how much closer does this card get you to winning. I think Will of the Wisp is indeed worse than Dark Seducer in some situations, but in a, lar, in, a lar, in a majority of situations, especially at the higher tier, Will of the Wisp becomes better. Because it becomes significantly better. If, if you're playing in a, I don't know... How different ranks are but i'm pretty sure at certain ranks no one plays silence i'm pretty sure that's true and in those cases dark seducer is just way better than will of the wisp but in a in a meta where people actually put in penitus oculatuses and silences and they actually know how to kill you really fast uh dark seducer is a dead card a traitorous card even sometimes <laughs> Yeah, so we have some good news to share with you guys before we continue. Is um, We actually played in two tournaments today. No joke. We signed up for two tournaments because we couldn't make up our mind. We were just doing it for fun. There was a Mythgard tournament and there's an Elder Scrolls Legends tournament. So we signed up for Elder Scrolls Legends tournament. And uh, the, the Mythgard tournament happened first, right? So my assumption was, well, I'm better at Elder Scrolls Legends than Mythgard. So I assumed that I would get eliminated in the Mythgard tournament really fast. So I just like, oh, the Mythgard tournament starts one hour before the Elder Scrolls Legends. I'll just sign up for the Mythgard tournament, just have some fun, we'll get knocked out, then we'll try on the Elder Scrolls Legends, just have fun there. So <laughs> what ends up happening is we win two games in a row in the Mythgard tournament, and then the Elder Scrolls tournament starts, and I'm just like, oh, this is awkward. So I was almost put in a situation where I was playing two tournaments literally at the same time. But good news was my Mythgard, I beat my opponent so fast that my uh, next game was not yet. So if you're wondering why we're talking about goblins so much, well, we got wrecked by goblins. Yeah. And let's not forget, Tazcat's a goblin. So, um, heads off to my opponent I played against. But we got eliminated in round one in uh, the warp meta for today. But in terms of Mythgard, we ended up getting third place in a 70 person tournament, which is pretty crazy to me. In a, it was a mono color tournament, so I chose mono green. Um, the two pe I only lost to two people uh, series, and I lost to the first and second place persons. So I, I actually went against, I went to the winner brackets finals. So if I won the winner brackets finals, I would have gone to the grand finals. I lost the winner brackets finals and I went to the loser brackets finals. Then I lost to the loser bracket final finalist. So then the loser bracket finalist who beat me advanced to the grand finals. And uh, 
was really we funny. I actually took a win off of both play. I beat both the second and first place pe people in my first games because it's best out of three. But they came back strong on on the on sec games two and game three. Like games two was really close. So it was like I won game one. Game two was really co close on both games. Game three I got annihilated. So basically my my opponents figured me out on like on turn three on game three. It's like I had element of surprise on game one, but L game three they figured it out by that time. And um, I surprised myself by getting so far. But what was really interesting was I was the last person to beat the grand champion because the grand champion came from the losers bracket, beat me, two one, then went into a series versus the the winners bracket finals. They had some crazy rules, okay? So the winner winner bracket finalist who beat me and then loser brackets finalist who beat me, they both had to play uh, two more series. Uh, they had to play a series, best out three. If the winner bracket finalist won. He wins. So he only needed to win one series and he wins. One best out of three and he wins. Loser's bracket finalist had a disadvantage. He had to win two best out of threes in a row. So he had to beat the uh, winner bracket finalist twice in a row. So that means he plays him one best out of three, then plays him another best out of three. And he beat him in both of them and didn't even lose a single game. So he went 4-0. Which means I'm the last person who beat the grand finalist. It's kind of cool. But, um... Definitely a crazy game. So I'm excited to share that with you. I'll, I'll just... So we will continue our, our set. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to link this little set. All right. Aaron Thea Gorilla. Again, this question card is a question mark. It's not something we've seen played. It's not a card we've played with. So this is theory crafting now. So what's the worst case scenario? What's average case scenario? What's the best case scenario? So the worst case scenario, the good news about a three drop for a three, four is that is the worst case scenario. You, you get what you pay for. It's the same as a discerning thief. Worst case scenario, it's the same as a Grave Viper Brigand. 3-4. Now the the thing is, the the card that I'm starting to think is trending towards best 3 drop in the game is Outland Patrol. Like Outland Patrol is a 3-4 in uh, purple. If it dies, plus 1, plus 1 to a card in your hand. And there's a lot of things about that card that makes it kind of better. And one of them is that its worst case scenario is if it dies, it, you get value. And I think... It's not to be underestimated. Plus one, plus one is is a is not only good on its own, but it's it comes really good when it's like falls onto an emperor's attendant. Emperor's attendant can then buff something else. It's like it's like a chain reaction kind of card. Ar Arenthia Gorilla kind of lacks this, so it's I would rate it for sure worse than Outland Patrol, and has no natural synergies with anything that I could think of, because lethal on your opponent's turn isn't something that you can use. In one of the things that makes Elder Scrolls Legends different from Magic the Gathering is Magic the Gathering in Magic, you can actually do things on your opponent's turn. And uh, when computer card games were designed, a number of games, Hearthstone included, if I'm not mistaken, chose to basically say, we're going to make this simple. Your turn is your turn, my turn is my turn. So they, you can't use instants. There's no such thing as instants and sorceries. So technically, the only person who can make use of lethal in your opponent's turn is your opponent. They can steal it with Anasi. They can steal it with Penentos Oculatus. So like technically, there are situations where Arenthia Gorilla loses the lethal and it's given to your opponent. Um, and while you might we might think, well, that's not too common. Unfortunately, An Anasi is literally auto included in almost almost all decks that can run her. Penentos Oculatus is isn't there but Anasi like if you're running this card I'm imagining your deck has lethal already you probably have lethal creatures so you're probably trying to do some kind of lethal thing I don't know if Wood Elf has enough synergies but the idea is um, this card becomes a little vulnerable to Anasi but if that's the worst scenario if Anasi steals it 3-4 for 3 is still respectable 
is still respectable. It's just below Outland Patrol because Outland Patrol, there's not too many things that can steal it and silencing it doesn't feel right. Like silencing Outland Patrol almost always feels wrong because a hand buff decks have a lot of things that you want to silence. Like think about hand buff. They buff some creatures to 10 attack and those cards you may want to silence or you might want to use your sorcerer negation on the um the doomed adventurer the one drop plus three plus three because that's like plus three plus three like because that's even more stats right so the, it it's never really clear whether you should silence an outland patrol because if you really silenced it they don't really care because plus one plus one's not that crazy and at the same time if you silence it that's not really answering the body on the board So, acceptable but below par, especially where the three fours are trending. And it's hard, you can't, we can't make use of the lethal, and your opponents can. Now, the average case scenario, I think, is your opponents will not steal the lethal. They won't steal the lethal. So, we'll just assume you're going to always get lethal on your turn. And, um,. Now this card actually could be silenced. Now this card actually might be worth silencing. Like in some situations, let's pretend you boldly put the Renthia Gorilla in front of a bigger creature saying, na 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 na, you can't get me, I'm lethal. Like in some situations, you might bait yourself into thinking she's actually going to keep lethal up and your opponents actually silence her because it allows them to get, get a favorable trade. Because I would imagine the only time you care about lethal anyway it's when your opponent's creature literally has more than three toughness. Because why would you need lethal if your normal attack kills it? So the only time you kind of want the lethal to even come into effect is when they have four toughness or greater. And the thing is, that could actually be judoed against you and baited out if they sorcerer negate you trade or some something like some combination of that. Um, but the average case scenario is I think you're going to get a 3-4 that your opponent will not shenanigan that they will not they will not remove the lethal so they will either ignore this creature and force you to attack with into it or they will race you like when i say ignore the creature they will not attack they will not even attack it when it's got lethal like if they have an emperor's blade in front of this you put this in the field lane why they, why do they even need to attack it they can just keep attacking your face because your 3-4 has lethal on their turn, so they can't trade into it, but neither can you. So your 3-4 is kind of stranded because it can't attack around the 4-5 four, four guard. So the Gorilla kind of has this awkwardness where it's like, okay, sure. On, I think on, so this is, if this sounds bad, yes. So on average, it's worst case scenario doesn't sound, on average, it's average case scenario doesn't sound too good. Like it sounds kind of, like, it sounds bad. Like, you see how she's waiting in the trees? Well, maybe that's all she's going to do when there's an Emperor's Blight in front of her. She's going to sit there and can't attack. And I think that can happen a little bit more often than we'd like. Like, that doesn't sound very unkind. Like, they have a Hive Defender. They put a Hive Defender in front of you. What are you going to do? Like, you can start... Ch you can try it. Like, you could try it into it over two turns, but at which point... Wouldn't you have just wished you put a lethal creature in your deck? Like, a lethal creature would have just stopped that. Like, why her instead of another lethal creature that can actually have kill the Hive Defender and save damage going your face? Now, unfortunately for Arinthia Gorilla, it, it would appear that her best case scenario and her average case scenario are very similar. The only difference that I can see the only difference I can see is for whatever reason, your opponent has to trade into this creature. Maybe you skinned Hound on Arunthia Gorilla, and you put her in the field lane, and you're racing them. You're dealing so much damage to them. You've, or you, you, you're you in the field lane, you've pushed them into the shadow lane, and for whatever reason, you're not doing normal stuff. You're not actually attacking their face, but you've decided to put in your Arunthia Gorilla tech choice, and then use the skinned Hound to um, give it more toughness and guard and just like block them off and say, haha, I'm gonna win the race. 
Now the problem with that is that sounds so vulnerable to Emperor's, uh, sorry, Edict of Azura's, Javelin's, Silences. Like, the moment you put your trust like that, uh, like, usually when you use Skinned Hound, you're trying not to do things like that because if you use Skinned Hound to buff a creature that has lethal, you're actually opening yourself up to the vulnerability that you might lose all that investment in one go. Like, just one card could just destroy that plan. So you try not to do that if you can't help it. And if you do do something like that, you're trying to get the value out of it immediately. So you're not trying to wait for your opponent. You're trying to use the Skin Hound, trade it. Like, using Skin Hound's guard and trading into something and surviving is always better, almost always better, than using Skin Hound passively and just putting up a guard and just hoping they don't have something there. So Arenthia Gorilla, foot in the shadow lane and doing that as a best case scenario where they're forced to trade. This sounds like the best case scenario and unfortunately, it's very niche. Like this situation won't happen that much. And if it does happen, like when you say it won't happen that much, it's not only you need the skin hound to put a guard so for them to trade in, it's also that you need them to not have an answer. You need them to not have source litigation. You need your cards, like your cards in field lane to have, you need field lane control. You need to have pushed them into the shadow lane. So there's too many, I need this, I need this, and this, and this, and this. That's when the plan becomes a little bit too needy. It's like it needs too many things to go right. And when you're developing a plan, you don't want it to be, you don't want it to require perfection. The opposite of this is robustness. So a well-built plan has failure tolerance designed into it. Like you build a plan assuming things can go wrong. It's like, what is the point of preparing? Preparation is to prepare if this goes wrong, if that goes wrong, if this goes wrong. If your plan starts to be like, I'm, I'm creating this perfect blueprint and it needs this and it needs this and it needs this, you're creating too many failure points. A single failure in any one of that chain and your whole plan's busted. So like, if you build an elaborate plan that needs 20 things to go right, if one thing goes wrong, the whole thing goes to shit. A well-built plan doesn't need 20 things to go right. It, it, it is a plan, a well-built plan is a plan that has 20 things can go wrong and it will still work. So if it can, 20 things go wrong, failure tolerance is built in so that even if 20 things go wrong, we can still arrive at the outcome we want. So I, I think this is a, I like cards like this because they, they not not necessarily because I'm going to play them, but because the reason why we're talking about these um, card reviews in the first place is more or less about practicing valuation, practicing thinking. How do I, if I'm looking at a two different cards, should I buy Model A or should I buy Model B? If I'm looking at Career Path A or Career B Path B, which one should I take? Um, should I spend my time with these groups of friends tonight, or should I? Spend it this way. Should I spend Thanksgiving here or should I spend it there? These are all valuation questions where we're basically forced to make a decision based off of limited information. You might want have been invited to two different parties, but you don't know which one's going to be more fun and you will never know. So you have to take a risk because I can go to party A or I can go to party B. So I like how Arenthia Gorilla forces us to think about uh, things in this way. A Bitterfish Witch, 3 drop, 2 2, Prophecy Give a Creature minus 1 minus 1. So, the worst case scenario of this card is you have to play it and you have nothing on board, and the creature you gave 1 minus 1 minus 1 is still going to attack you, and Bitterfish Witch can't even kill it. Like, a Mournhold Trader is a great example. A Mournhold Trader is a 4 4. At a two drop. So if you played Bitterfish Witch right after the Mornhold Trader, the Mornhold Trader becomes a 3-3, three, three, and the Bitterfish Witch still can't kill it. As a this card is way understated for a three drop. Like the three four is a seven seven stats. This is four in stats. This is three stats less than the gorilla we just talked about. As a three drop. 
So when playing this card, we need to get a lot of value out of its ability. And its ability is present in Murkwater Witch. So we consider Bitterfish Witch the bougie witch. Murkwater Witch, she's a lot more... She's a lot more down to earth. She's more... She's less high maintenance. Because Bitterfish Witch has the same ability as Murkwater Witch. Murkwater Witch minus one minus one is a two drop. This is a three drop for the exact same thing. And the difference is you've got one plus one plus one in stats, but you don't have guard. And you get prophecy. So the average case scenario of this card is, is luckily this kind of problem can be avoided. So the problem that we just talked about, how the worst case scenario is like you just made a Mournhold Trader weaker, but you can't even trade into it. This kind of problem can actually be solved at the deck building phase. The deck building phase allows us to design for this. Like we should build decks with Mournhold Trader in mind. We should think to ourselves, what if they do this? What if they do that? And sometimes people think that this is very hard. They think, well, when I'm designing decks, it's difficult to think of so many turns in advance. But I've learned recently it's not actually that hard. If you really wanted to become better at deck building, you don't need to think about turns 1 through infinity. Think about turns 1 through 5. Just think about turns 1 through 5. That's it. What's your deck's turn 1 play? What's your best turn 1 play? What's your best turn 2 play? What's your best turn 3 play? 4 and 5. You just think those through turns one through five your deck will become way better immediately especially as a control player because if you're if your turns one through five and it, it, it's applicable to aggro but if your turns one through five are thought out you will know your understand your deck better you'll be like what am i trying to even play on one two three four five there's only a limited number of one two three fours and fives in any given deck so if i look at this deck there are only these twos, there's only one one, there's only these twos, there's only one three, there's only these fours, and there's only these fives. So there's not that many. So that means if I just put my hand and covered half this deck, that's what we're talking about, turn one, three, four, five. And then you can think to yourself, well, what am I afraid of? What do they play on two that I'm afraid of? If they play something I'm afraid of, what do I answer? That's why Harpies in the deck, because Harpies can answer many things we're afraid of. If on turn three, what are we afraid of? Corner Club Gambler. Channel Storm kills a Corner Club Gambler. On turn four, what are we afraid of? On turn five, what are we afraid of? Leaf Lurker more or less can kill almost anything if one of these things got in their way, as an example. So these are just, just one way to think about um, best and worst case scenarios. So the, in a deck building phase, Bitterfish Witch, very similar to the other goblins we've spoken of, just makes good use of the goblin tag. I'm not sure how many goblins are in the deck game, and we can just check right now. And if there aren't enough goblins to go 50 card goblin, so let's see how many goblins are there. So there's not enough card. So one of the reasons why this card is probably finding a home is because it does enough it doesn't it's not perfect for what you want but it does enough it synergizes enough simply because if you just added the goblins up one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven even if you put full copies of every single goblin you not come out to 50. so that's one reason why the deck will find a home the card will find a home in the goblin deck So this card is probably one of the lower performing cards in the High Tempo Goblin deck. And it's kind of on performance review. Like it's in there as long as there isn't a better goblin. And as the game, if Elder Scrolls Legends continues to have more and more goblins, Bitter Fish Wished will probably be one of the first ones to be swapped out for a superior goblin. I just don't think the prophecy is, is relevant. So, um, worse. Um, 
So average case scenario, I think, though, is this card will be able to set up. If a deck is built around the Goblin Synergies, it will be able to set up Leaf Lurkers. It will be able to set up buffs onto the Merc Water, I mean the Bloody Hand Chef. It will be able to um, create enough board control, like uh, lane control for the field lane. Like minus one, minus one is exactly what this deck is even looking for. And with Merc Water Witch, this is a turn three play. What is their turn four ideal play? Merc Water Witch, uh, Merc Water Scourge. So Bitterfish Witch, Merc Water Scourge. Sometimes, or maybe the plus two, plus two Goblin. It, it fits right in like a glove. So, also these decks that you've used Curse and they're controlling the field lane, they actually need someone to sacrifice their life. They need cards, like they want cards to go face, but they also need cards to trade into guards and to sacrifice and to trade into creatures to protect their more valuable threats. And because Murkwater, which already got most of its value from the minus one, minus one, it it is a prime candidate. So not only is it the card that is on performance review to be swapped out of the deck, it's also the card that is probably selected to trade in to sacrifice its life, even, even over this card. Like, if, if there was a card that they needed to just Leaf Lurker, let's say there's this card in the field lane and the other card in the, the field lane, this card only does two damage. This one does three damage to something. So because this one does more, this one drop does more, she would be sent in to set up the Leaf Lurker over the one drop. I am so hungry. We will press on. <laughs> So the, the best case scenario of this card is it, it's setting up that Leaf Lurker. It's buffing, like not only is it setting up the Leaf Lurker, it's also buffing the Bloody Hand Chef at the same time. And it's also getting into position. It's a Goblin on board that will be buffed by the plus two, plus two Goblin. So there you see three synergies in one. And a fourth synergy is it's in position to trade into any guards, any Fighters Guild recruits, anything so that your larger threats can connect. Mountain Lion, 4-3, gain one magic of this turn. So this card's worst case scenario is you play it as a three magicka, 4-3, same thing as Andai Clan Sorcerer, and you don't use the one magicka. Its average case scenario is that, I think its average case scenario is that it's a, it's a two drop. It, because three drop gain one magicka reads it's a two drop, it's like three minus one is two. So this card really is a two drop with the caveat that it cannot be played unless you have three to spend. So you, it's a two drop with a conditional, just like Nixox. Nixox is a seven drop, but it gives you five back magicka back. So a Nixox is actually a two drop as well. It just can't be played until you have seven magicka. So some people have thought some people think Nixox is a greedy card. I don't agree. I don't agree with them at all. Nixox is not greedy. It is a it, or Eclipse Baroness. Nixox and Eclipse Baroness. If you look carefully, what they do, they get you your Magicka back. It's like Nixox. Turn seven, seven Magicka. Play a five five. It's a two drop five five. Where else in the game do you see a two drop five five? Because then right after you play Nixox, you can literally play 5-drop. You can play Leaf Flicker. You can play His Mage. You can even play Trickster Mage if that's if that's what you like. Which, by the way, is a huge surprise to me. I thought, I thought Trickster Mage would take over. Like, I thought Trickster Mage would make Dagoth so popular. I was actually really scared. I was like, oh, how am I going to hit top 10 ever? If, if, like, Dagoth's already a really bad matchup for some of my decks, I was just thinking... Whoa, like Assassin as well. Like Assassin and Dagoth are very good against control decks. They're just good. Like they just break Ebonheart in half. So, because of wards and all this ward. But I, I thought that people would play Trickster Mage a lot more than they are. And I thought Trickster Mage was going to be a lot better than it is. So that's just an example of us being incorrect. 
it's a good card. Like, the card's really good. But for some reason, it's just not taking over. And maybe Invade has something to do with that. So, on average, it's a two drop. So, think of it on average as a two drop. Because this means if you play it with six Magicka, you now have four more Magicka to play with. If you play it with seven Magicka, you have five Magicka to play with. In this case, it's a good card. A two drop. 4-3 is better than a 3-drop 4-3. It's better than Ondai. Now, it's in fact, it actually might even be one of the best 2-drops in the game. Because the other 2-drop is 4-2 Jackal. So like this is the other two drop. Like this is the other two, two drop, and this card was seeing play. So I can see why Mountain Lion is actually pretty good. And under this lens, is it's basically a mount. It's a slinking jackal that doesn't die to Wardcrafter on its first hit, and that's pretty significant because slinking jackal was vulnerable. Wardcrafter's auto included so many decks, and it dies to Barrowstalker. This card can trade into those cards, and it, that's how it's it's passing the two drop test. It's it's a two drop that's surviving best in class two drops. It does not die on con it does not die in combat. And that's that's also going back to this guy. This guy kills the mountain lion. Like that tells you how come this guy's so good. Like if this card can kill the mountain lion and Wardcrafter can't, and uh Barrow Stalker can't, you see why one drop has suddenly become amazing. Even Dominion Oathman, I think Dominion Oathman I during Alliance War, I considered Dominion Oathman the number one one drop in the game. Dominion Oathman can't even scratch this. Like, can scratch, literally scratch the mountain line versus this card kills the mountain line. There's a huge difference. If you have to play a Dominion Oathman and he can't kill this, it feels bad moment. You're going to have to invest additional resources like a Crown Quartermaster, um, a Steel Dagger. And this goes back to. Oh, it's 10. It's 10 p.m. It's not too bad. We just started two hours ago or something, two and a half hours ago, so. We can't help it. We're just so excited about cards. We just so much to say, so much to think. Yeah. We're in Northern California. So, the best case scenario is you find this card on Curve, you have the Ring of Magicka. You play it on turn two, and you play a scary one drop. Mud Crab Merchant, Morag Tong. I prefer the Mud Crab Merchant because Mountain Lion's problem that I'm seeing, like, another part of its worst case scenario, like its worst case scenario is not bad at all. It could three drop becomes a two drop. The worst case scenario is you just float the Magicka, so you literally, it's just, okay, you didn't make any use of Magicka, so it's a three drop. The other side of it is you just don't have cards to play. Like, if you're running a curve that's too low, and this is something that uh, aggro players probably, um, it's always their, their, their challenge is to balance how much aggression, like how low do you make your curve, but how do you make sure you don't run out of gas? Like, you need to make sure you have just enough gas to kill them, but you want to do it super fast, super consistently. So Mountain Lion, I think Mud Crab would be better because Mud Crab refuels the hand. And it's an animal. Beast and Crabs are animal synergy. So they can these cards, as we saw from the Goblin package, plus two plus two to all goblins is a big deal. Plus two plus two to all animals is also a big deal. The only problem with the plus two plus two to all animals lucky everybody else who doesn't like animal decks, is it needs a 7 drop. There's a 7 drop that does plus 2 plus 2 all animals. The goblin's a 4 drop. So there's a 4 drop that does plus 2 plus 2 all goblins. But when it comes to animals, it's a 7 drop. That's the difference. So if, there, if that 7 drop was a 4 drop, dude, you'd see animals everywhere. These crabs are already everywhere. And I do like uh, this deck card being... I do think the neutrality of the mud crab conscription makes it a must include for this mountain lion because I think they I think they slot in really well together. Like, I mean, we did play a few aggressive decks, but recently, but every single one we did, we 
made sure to have a Mudcrab thing. Because the Mudcrab cards, so much value. So much value, so much tempo, so much deck thinning. Now, I don't think it's necessarily correct to have the Mudcrab package in every deck. But I think um, many, many decks benefit from it. And it's something that we'd have to explore a little further. So Unicorn, worst case scenario, is you uh, play this card on turn three, and um, your opponents almost killed you. <laughs> like, you play, so the, this card screams aggression, right? This unicorn screams aggression. We've said this can go with items, this can go with animals. It can also go with lethal creatures. Like, lethal creatures have a tendency to have one attack, a rack and venom tongues. Or the Lothi Assassins. So technically, Ebonheart, lethal creatures can charge in and get his trades in, so that would be a more defensive application of Unicorn. Also being a two tough a two attack creature, this synergizes with Ordernian Necromancer, if that's what you think. And you know what? This card even synergizes with hand buff if someone dared to use hand buff with green. Technically, wow, I could be like the first person. I could just throw in three into my Empire deck. Why don't we just do that right now? That's kind of funny. Wait, why don't we... So just like, look at the deck. So who wants to get replaced? Who needs Piercing Javelin? Piercing Javelin's overrated. Unicorn. Unicorn. This deck's just gonna get a unicorn, so right now. I just realized, wait a minute. These unicorns could be put in a hand buff deck. Why don't we give the Faded Wraith charge? I mean, Divine Fervor, Praetorian Commanders. Why didn't they? That, that's actually pretty funny. We should probably try this out sometime. But this, this idea of using unicorns as your finisher, how funny would that be if you just like use unicorns with Divine Fervor's Moon Touch? Do you play this? Uh... All right, this is the combo. Your first unicorn is six attack. Your second unicorn is five attack. So your second unicorn can charge. And after that, you play all these other creatures. Mind you, this deck actually can ramp like crazy. Because of determined suppliers, it's not unheard of using tree minders, determined suppliers, and his mages to go to 20 magicka, which becomes a situation where you could technically play a unicorn and then five other cards. So if you play a unicorn and five other charging creatures, that would be crazy. I've it just it just dawned on me that it's possible to put it with hand buff. If you end up doing that, please let me know. Show me a video and I will I'll check it out because I hand buff the unicorns. I'm assuming that question OTK as well. You you want, kind of want to hold off. With the unicorn, I believe so. Yes, like the thing is, <laughs> the, the the hand but that hand buff deck. What's really funny too is it has necromancers into necromancers into unicorns. It's not even unheard of. Like, imagine someone plays a unicorn that's been buffed, and then they play Odernian necromancer into Odernian necromancer into Odernian necromancer into a unicorn or something like that. Just imagine charging with four unicorn four 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 necromancers so like the unicorn comes down it's been buffed everything else is just charging because like the first you we're talking about divine fervors we're talking about like so divine fervor a lot fifth legion trainers all these cards fifth legion trainer on unicorn suddenly becomes a three three now two attack creatures four now it's fervor now it's a four attack creatures can charge you see like a charging necromancer army I'm glad we found it. We found it. I was I was really thinking hard about like where can these three unicorns be played, and suddenly it just seems like this hand buff deck would be better, way better than Ebonheart. Because Ebonheart's kind of like. All right. Again, what we just said is theory crafting, so it might not work. But I mean, just. Have you played that deck? I know it's possible because hand buffing your creatures to like 
insane numbers is not is not too hard. Now the only problem with that is your unicorn that's super buffed. Let's say that you have a seven seven unicorn, so all six attack creatures can charge. Can't charge. So that there is that. So you just put a seven drop that can't charge. But it's cute. And maybe it is an OTK, because if you did ramp enough and you did have Necromancer to Necromancer, that's six Magicka, that's nine Magicka. So if you if you did a unicorn into order Necromancer, 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 blah blah blah. See how many have how do you have so many Necromancers? Galen is one is one way. So the worst case scenario of Unicorn is that uh, I think I think it's a combo piece. Think of this card as a combo piece. So in the in this big scheme of things, there are five types of decks. There's aggro decks, mid-range decks, control decks, greed decks, and combo decks. So when you think about the first four decks, it's a spectrum. It's about how I like to ask the question is when you look at a deck, what turn does this deck want to win by? Where is this deck strong? What turn is this deck strongest at? Every deck has a turn where it's strongest at, and then it has turns where it starts to fall off, or it has turns where they're not even online yet. So, uh, aggro deck, their win, their strongest turns are earlier. A mid range deck, their strongest turns are things like turn five through nine. Control decks, their strongest turns are things like turn seven. Plus, so there is overlap. That means aggro and mid range. These are just terms we use to class decks, and there are there are it's a spectrum. So there are decks that are more aggro as aggro decks are even farther to the left, more aggro than the other aggro decks. Then there are uh, aggro decks that are more at the mid range level. That means they're further to the right. They're, they have more top end. Then you look at mid range. Mid range has decks that are more aggro, and then they have decks that are more control like. There are mid range decks that have Odavings. There are mid range decks that have Dawn Wrath, Dawn's Wrath, right? There are mid range decks that have Mana Marco, as an example. Now, there are control decks that are lower to the ground that look resemble more like mid range decks. Then there are control decks that look super, super late game oriented. They start to resemble greed decks. So it's a spectrum between. The decks that want to win earlier, that are stronger earlier, and the decks that are want to win later, and are stronger later. So the difference between a control deck and a greed deck is control decks have more late game than a mid-range deck, but a greed deck has more late game than a control deck. So control decks could even seen as two different class of control decks. Like greed decks are control decks that are designed to beat control decks. They're anti-control decks. They have cards in them that are bad against aggro, but they're super good against control. Think Chromite Magus. Chromite Magus, 7 drop, 5-5 five, five guard. This is ridiculously bad in some situations, but it just knocks out conscriptions. Tullius, um, Journey to Sovngrad, dead card against everybody else except for control. So these are the anti-control cards that in the decree package. Now, Unicorn is in a combo. It's a combo card. Like, this card is a combo piece. As a combo piece, notice how I used four aggro, mid-range, control, and greed. Those are four classes of deck. Combo is outside of those. Like combo is a loose term that refers to many different types of deck that basically have a built-in synergies that certain cards that aren't very good by themselves, when combined together, can break the game. When I say break the game, they start to do things that the original designers did not intend. So, Market Assassin. The people who made um, all those zero cost cards and Swindler's Markets n probably never imagined people doing what they did. Maybe they imagined it on some sort of small level, but they didn't imagine it with all the zero cost cards with the Hex Mages. Ebonheart Slay, the first person who designed Falkreath Defiler, probably didn't think it was broken, and people didn't really seem to know how to break it. I, I don't think, for some reason, Falkreath Defiler wasn't broken until Ebonheart Slay became a tricolor in Alliance War. That means Falkreath Defiler wasn't, didn't even need a nerf, because even with its powerful abilities, it didn't do, it didn't seem to do much. I don't think so. But once, 
it was in the Ebonheart colors, it broke the game because it was a combo with the Unstoppable Rage of the Falkreath Defiler. It was with the... So in red, it's Unstoppable Rage. In green, it's Brotherhood Sanctuary. In purple, it's Falkreath Defiler. Previously, you could only do two of those cards. But now with all three together, you can empty your whole grave and put your whole grave back on the board. That made that deck a combo deck. To me, invades a combo deck, hand buffs a combo deck. And the thing about combo decks is they can start to resemble the different types of decks. So hand buff as a combo deck can resemble a greed deck. It's a combo greed deck. Market Assassin as a combo deck can resemble a combo aggro deck. You see. So Unicorns seems like a combo piece because it cannot do much on its own. And it must, in order for it to be worthy of even in being included in the deck, it needs to get ridiculous value. You don't just put two, three, three drops. Like Sir and Pawnbroker played flat, it's just better as a two drop, right? In many situations. So the this is why when people are playing with Unicorn, you need to investigate with like, how do we break the game? The, the, the game designers created a card. They just thought it, they, they, they just gave it some interesting abilities. They don't know all the possibilities. The game designers did not make Unicorn thinking of all its possibilities. They actually are leaving it to the players to find out and figure out what they can do with it. And if they break it too far, that's when they'll send in the nerfs. But they put it in and say, Let's see if anyone could do anything with it. So, my natural slotting is, okay. The worst case scenario of the card is very bad. It's slow. But it can be mitigated. So that's actually how we should think about worst case scenarios. Every card has a worst case scenario. And if a card is a combo piece, it's not like it's just pure bad. Just because it's a dead card doesn't mean all the other cards in your deck have to be dead cards. So you can build other cards, other capabilities in the deck to survive so you can get to that combo turn. So Unicorn needs some kind of combo turn. And Charge does scream OTK, honestly. Like, the fact friendly creatures get Charge screams that this is a needs other card creatures. Charge screams this is actually can be used for a lethal play. Just like we mentioned how this, actually this upcoming card is also in a Halalu Rage, Blade Stalwart with a Brotherhood Sanctuary could use Rage, kill four creatures on lane, get plus 20 attack. One second. All right, so we kind of got carried away on Unicorn, but uh, we were inspired. We were guy. We got inspired thinking about the possibilities with Unicorn, and, and took the opportunity to explain some of the uh, fundamentals that might slip 
will probably slip your average player because there are people asking on Discord like, what's the difference between mid range and aggro, all this kind of stuff and combo. So, the worst case scenario of this card is you, you can't use it. And th that's not that bad because if the worst case scenario is you can't use it, let's assume this card did have a one turn kill application in a deck. If that was true, at least one third of the deck should be built around not dying. So that, and it's actually what I got excited about with Empire, um, Empire sort of hand buff is because literally one third of the deck is built around not dying. So if one third of the deck is not is built around not dying, and then one third of the deck, like look how low to the ground this deck. This deck is super low to the ground. It curves out on sixes. Tullius Conscription, three of, three, six drops. That's the top end. So the majority of the deck is built to survive. So if the majority of the deck is built to survive, and the deck actually has these sort of free slots, that's where a home for Unicorn might make sense. It has free slots because the deck is so strong already that it doesn't really... It actually has certain car. It had slots that could literally just be anything, like Moon Touch Guardian, for example. These things can just be kicked out. You can put anything. In. You can put anything in there. These unicorns, they could just be kicked out. They could be anything, and that's where sometimes when we talk combo deck, I use my this deck as an example. A combo deck doesn't need to be fully all in on one combo. So like there are combo decks. Like this deck has a, I'll just use my deck that I got top 10 with because that's my best deck. This deck has combos in it, multiple combos. So I think the thing is, it doesn't have one combo, it has multiple combos. The thing is, like for example, Zifkin Bane Lord Shearpoint Dragon is one combo. Yeah, that's a combo right there. Wolfric's Uprising Shearpoint Dragon, that's another combo. Tullius Conscription, Journey to Sovngrad, that's another combo. Altar of Despair, Journey to Sovngrad, that's another combo. All these cards being summoning abilities with Ulfric Uprising, that's another combo. So, when building a deck, I think non-combo players should be a little bit more open to the idea of embedding combos in their deck. One way of thinking about a combo is it's just a highly synergistic sequence of sequencing of cards. So if you have cards in your deck and they don't synergize with each other, they're just like not, they're not getting the best value out of each other. Then ask the question, is there a way to? Because even, even though some of the, even your two drops, can synergize with your other cards. So, synergy, when it's taken to its extreme, it becomes a combo. It's like, synergy is like this card helps this card, but when they are helping each other in a way that breaks the game, it becomes a combo. And the thing about uh, a combo deck is there are, there are combo decks like Invade that are built around a single combo, but there are also decks that are not even combo decks, like a control deck can have multiple combos built in within in it. And if you can see this actually in uh, Ebonheart, Rage decks and Telvani decks, there are decks that Telvani decks that hide a single combo in it. Like uh, a common one, a popular one is Flesh Atronach. Flesh Atronach and uh, Mentor's Ring. So Flesh, Flesh Atronach is a card I don't have, but I know much about it. This card says summon plus one plus one for each creature in your discard pile. If you have 20 creatures in your discard pile, this is a 22-22. If you have 30 creatures in your discard pile, it's a 31-31. Okay? Now, first of all, you say, well, it's a 1-1. One -one. That sucks. No, no, no. That's good. If it's a 1-1, one -one, it means Odernian Necromancer can bring it back. You can use Merchant's Camel to throw this into the grave 
and your opponent will not even may not even think of it they may not even see it coming you odernian necromancer bring this back then you find territorial viper a charging creature so that's six magicka plus four four magicka charging creature then you play Mentor's Ring. Give this key creature's keywords to each other friendly creature. So you can give your Flesh Atronach 30 attack creature charge. And that is a combo. And But usually decks that run this, they barely rely on this. As they don't they don't rely on this as their as their finisher. They just have it in there. That's just three cards in the deck. Three out of seventy-five. And the cards have different applications to it. Like, for example, Territorial Viper by itself is always good. Mentor's Ring can be used as a stabilization tool with Mentor, with Barrow Stalkers, Wardcrafters, Fighters, Guild Recruit. So they don't need the combo to become to win the game. But they know that if shit hits the fan, they have this hidden combo in the, in the deck where they will pull it out on you, especially in, like, mirror matches where they stalemates. So I think we'll, we'll move on to the next card because um, we're going to still say there's a question mark on the unicorn, but we see now a unicorn in a new light. We see her as a combo piece that as new cards, she synergizes probably with certain decks that have not been discovered yet. Beasts, animal decks, item decks, hand buff decks. I think... Um, in the future, as more cards get released, Unicorn it might be like a market. She may be a sleeper, so it might be just like the market. Swindler's Market was not a playable card when it was first released, from what I understand. It took many expansion packs later where, where someone figured out, whoa, this kills people. So we talked about him enough, so I think we're, we're going to skip Blade Flanker. It's... it's there's too much, um, it's not, I wouldn't consider this card too much, because we're getting a little tired, so we'll get ready to, on the final cards. So Blade's Flanker, I think his worst case scenario is too much for Constructed. And that, like, it, it's too much, because it requires lane splitting. Blade's Stalwart, we talked about for quite a bit as well. Um... I want to just emphasize Blade Stalwart's ability as a combo piece, because now I can kind of see it. I can kind of see it. Worst case scenario is that she's one toughness worse than Hive Defender and doesn't have guard. So it's acceptable. She's in the acceptable range of... of... Her worst case scenario is acceptable to me. Hive Defender is the golden standard, and if she's just a little worse than Hive Defender, it's okay. It's not ideal, but it's okay if she can win me the game. So I wouldn't necessarily scream at putting three of her in a deck. You do not need to put three of a card in a deck. The reason someone wants to put, I think the reason why a person would play this is they want to one turn kill someone with unstoppable rage. You play this card in the shadow lane, bait the, or in the field lane, doesn't matter, shadow shift over to the lane that has four creatures, unstoppable rage them, and then attack their face. That's how this card is supposed to be played. If you cannot kill the creatures in the lane, slap an item on top of it. Slap Crusader's Assault on it. Halalu has the ability to do this. You can think of this as like a Flesh Hatred knock for Halalu. I think it's average case scenario and it's worst case scenario are pretty similar. So since it's like a slightly worse than Hive Defender, its average case scenario is that it kills one thing and then it gets killed. And it it's not nothing special. Like, you just play it. You, your Slay ability might go off, but like let's say this takes a lot of damage. If this actually takes four damage and it kills... Let's say this kills something. Slay means it only kills on your turn, by the way. 
when you slay is when you destroy a creature on your turn. So if a creature trades into this, it won't get any buff. It will only get buffed if it kills on its own turn, which basically means it doesn't. It either wants to be in field lane first or it wants to be in shadow lane to trade second. And the thing about this card is more likely than not, it will take too much damage. Like if it takes four damage, it goes to one plus one. What, what's what's a four one? Like what what is a four one doing? It's not going to do that much. Okay, it's not it really isn't. So it's actually things like unicorn and blade stalwart that it's okay if the if the worst case scenario is not as bad. So it's worst case scenario is not as bad as unicorn. Uh, unicorn, you play around the worst case scenario by just not playing it by building a deck around. That can, can like one third of the deck can help you mitigate that by having other playable turn threes plays and uh blade stalwart kind of worst case is better it's more playable on curve even if the situation's dire four drop it's not like it's incredibly worse than iraq and venom tongue and iraq and venom tongue is what a lot of turn four plays are for the slower kind of Ebonheart Slay uh, decks are running. So its average case scenario is like it it kills something, survives, it's a 4-1, it's and then it's just going to die soon. So you never got off. So now we look at the final upside is that is that is its, is its combo to potential? Is it really there? And I think it really is there. It needs some setup, and it cannot be relied on fully. So this card probably would be a 2 of in a deck, and it's used as a surprise its surprise factor is huge because people aren't used to losing to this card if people aren't used to losing to a card they can't see it coming its five toughness allows it to get into position green means it can move back and forth between lanes and and this basically means that okay even if your opponent answers it and stops you from doing your your rage play it doesn't have breakthrough, for example, so it doesn't actually signal to your opponent, hey, I have rage ready. I think we gave her fair treatment. She surprised me this is with some of the things I've said. The Grey Fox, so... We'll take this opportunity to just talk about some of the things like worst, average, and best case scenario. So it's, these cards, like Gray Fox, if you, because it's in a new set, if you put that in, in the deck, make sure that you're putting it in for a card that is equal or less than, equal or greater than in cost. So if you have a deck, if you have a Telvani deck and you want to put Gray Fox in, take out Zomogfum. That's a six drop. Put him in. Put in something else. And then you'd see the deck basically become a little bit lighter to the ground. That's pretty much how I, I view it. It's like when you're looking what to substitute stuff, just look at a If a deck is performing well for you, look at cards and be like, okay, I want to put in a three drop. Now, if you want to put in a three drop, it means take out a three drop or take out something that's worth more. Gray Fox being a one of means it's not that consistent. So it's not possible to build a game plan around game for Gray Fox. A one of card like this is too dangerous to build a deck around so he is more or less kind of oh i'm happy if i see him and i'm happy if i don't kind of card and in these type of decks you need other win conditions gray fox is not a win condition there's nothing about this card that says i'm a win condition and it actually depends on what your opponent has so your opponent has like, uh, if they're an aggro deck, this card doesn't have anything good to pull. You're just going to pull like Crown Quartermasters, Mornhold Traders. But if you're against a control deck with a lot of top end, like I said myself, you would end up finding gold. You'd be like striking gold on this card. It's pretty much Gray Fox, reasonably statted creature, draw me Parthenax. That's... So there is this problem, but it has variance where 
he has the variance of basically being sometimes not so good, not like not just like drawing nothing good, doesn't draw anything good, to drawing absolute game winning plays. And the thing is, that's not in your control because you don't get to decide who you're playing against. So this card, in that sense, does not actually counter anything. So you don't can't Gray Fox doesn't counter anything. You don't put in Gray Fox to counter a specific deck. It just happens that Gray Fox counters it because you ran into somebody that has good cards. So I think the worst case scenario is, can be mitigated is that, look, if you do, the two things is you don't see it when you want to see it, and you can't play it. Those are the two things. And if you can't play it, it's all a matter of um, do you have other plays to make? These cards that draw cards are called value generators. They generate value by adding more long-term, by adding card advantage to your deck. It's a card draw card. You draw a card with this card. So when you're building your deck, to make sure it's okay to put Gray Fox in, you need to be in a comfortable place. So you need, if you have a deck that has too many cards that draw your cards, too many um, Indural masterminds, too many merchants camels, too many of these card draw cards, you'll start losing games because cards that draw cards tend to have kind of bad stats. They do not they're not the best statted creatures. So you need to strike a balance where you have just, just like drain. Drain you want to make sure you have drain is interesting. Drain is you want to have the minimum you need to win. Card draw is you're trying to have it can be seen in the same way. You do want card draw. Card draw is good, but you don't actually need that much card draw to win. So if you have the minimum amount of card draw to win, that also works too. So the focus is what's the minimum amount of card draw I need to win against aggro? What's the minimum amount of card draw I need to win against control? What's the minimum amount of card draw I need to win against greed? The spectrum comes into play, and a card like... Um, Gray Fox performs better the further right. The, against greed decks, he's way better than aggro. Against control decks, he's better than mid-range. Right? It's, that's how it works. So, my recommendation when putting this card in is to you count how many card draw cards you have in your deck. Like, this is a pretty good practice. If you look at your deck, you can actually do stuff like count how many drain creatures you have count how many card draw cards you have. And if the card draw cards seem to be too many and you look at your games and you're dying with too many cards in your hand, then you need to start taking card draw cards out. If you're winning, if you're losing games because you don't have enough card draw cards, then you need to add card draw cards like this into the deck. You look at the spectrum, who are you losing to? Are you losing against aggro? Are you losing against control? Are you losing against mid-range? If you're losing against, if you're beating all your aggro decks, but you're losing to all your control deck matchups and you're a control deck maybe he fits in because he improves the control deck matchup while not improving your aggro deck matchup so looking at cards like this to say what matchup am i weak on that i'd like to improve on and does he offer that so he offers improved control and and greed matchup but does not improve your mid-range and your aggro matchup So I think your average case scenario, like, okay, the average case scenario is let's pretend you need to play something on turn five and you uh, have too many other cards and you want to play them on turn five. You play them on turn five and that means you're drawing a turns one, two, three, four, or five card. If your opponent, that, that, that has the caveat, if your opponent did not discard stuff, like if your opponent only had things die in the grave, you're drawing things that cost less than Gray Fox potentially. But if they have been throwing things away, then you can draw something more expensive. Now, that worst case scenario of drawing, playing him and not having a better play and being behind on board, that's a problem. So the deck building phase, build in better tools to survive. Now at that average case scenario, I think, I think let's say nothing's really happening in the game. Like, if, if there's board parity and both sides are kind of even, if Gray Fox draws... If Gray Fox draws a card that's 
of less value than five. I think that's the normal. I think that's normal. Now, if you have other plays to make, I would, and you're against control, hold off. Don't just play Gray Fox immediately. Wait it out. Make sure, get Gray Fox to draw one of their best cards. Then play that against them, if possible. Now, the best case scenario of Gray Fox is a little bit. What are the minimum number of cards? What are the minimum number of cards? Hi, Sasuke. E. Which card did I discuss? What are the minimum number of? I discussed all these cards already. We're just we're discussing that we. <laughs> what are the minimum number of card draws for each type of deck? I think um, you might have to ask that me that question another time, but I'll try to answer it briefly, because <laughs> because we're running a gas. But the. Uh, let's just look at one of my. Let's just look at my deck as an example, okay? It, we'll look at two of my decks and count them very fast. Um, Ebon Heartslay, three, six. I count this as card draw. Seven, eight, eleven, twelve, fifteen. I would count this as card draw. Necromancer's count as card draw. Eighteen. And I'd count these as card draw because they draw you blood. 21. 21 in Ebon Heart Slay. Um, now for my Delvani deck, where you at? Probably a lot. I think it's more. I think it's more of this. One. A four. Five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten. I count these as card draw cards. 11, 12, 13. Merkwar I count Merkwar Squid. Uh, 14. I count Altars. 15, 16. 17, 18, 19. 20, 21. 22. I'd count, I count, I count Uprisings, Altars, and Merkwater Scourges. So you, someone else could not count them, but I do count, I really do count Merkwater Scourges as, as card draw. Like, the two curses are literally two different cards that, do, like, if it wasn't for the fact they were, the, what makes Merkwater Scourges so good is you could use those curses independently of one another. You could literally focus fire all curses and take down a five toughness creature with the body, or you can say the body does something and the curses do something, and the curses go on two different targets. That's those are two different cards. They're just zero cost cards. And in fact, you could say it's 100% guaranteed. It's not 100% guaranteed. It's 100% guarantee on the first curse. But I'm saying you 100% know what you're drawing. That's the difference. Like a, like a Murkwater Scourge draws you two cards that you know what they are, which is actually really important because sometimes you just go fishing and you have no idea what you're drawing. And I would count um, Blood Magic Lords as card draw because they generate, they literally generate Blood Magic spells. And in that deck, they can draw out way more than one Blood Magic spell. They can draw like four. Like it's probably like, say, so Blood Magic Lord with a two Dark Brotherhood, two, bro two Dark Brotherhood Sanctuaries, Squish the Wimpy draws you two Blood Magic spells. If you've seen, there are replays that we have that we could uh, maybe. If you ask me in the future, I could link it if I could find it. It's not unheard of using Blood Magic Lord and Unstoppable Rage on the same turn with Brotherhood Sanctuaries and generating like 10 Blood Magic spells. Like 10. Like literally, it's like, you see me, my hands got like four cards, goes to six Blood Magic spells, and then like four more Blood Magic spells just go into the trash can. And then the other thing about Blood Magic spells is uh, Raise Dead itself is a card draw card. So like Raise Dead itself is generating two random cards at two, sometimes become Merchant's Camels, sometimes become Necromancers. So, so Blood Magic Lord is a card draw card that can then randomly draw a Blood Magic spell that is a card draw spell. So I say we're at the 20, 20 ish 20 range.
All right, so last two. So fresh start. Um, we'll talk about these last two cards briefly because I think we gave them pretty good treatment. So some of these cards, worst case scenario, is, is like, might sound boring, but it's literally, oh, I can't play this. And that is true to the truth, is there are a lot of good cards in this deck, game, like Odeving, whose worst case scenario is I can't play this, or it gets Moroccan. Like, if you're talking about Odeving, the worst case scenario is with Moroc, and so Odeving is stuff like, I can't play it, I'm dead already, or I get Moroc. These are, like, similar. So Fresh Start kind of... Like some of the cards like Gray Fox and Fresh Start, their problem is they just can't get played without... Like, the problem is they don't do anything for you immediately. And sometimes all you need is for something to happen immediately. So when you're building a deck, you want some cards that do things immediately, and then you want some cards that build value. So value-generating cards do not get their full value the same turn they're played. So like that's the thing about fresh start is by drawing three cards you you ignore the board state it ignores what's going on, but it's putting cards in your hand. That's great and all, if and only if you get to use those cards. If you have time to buy play those cards, if you do not have time to even play one or two more cards, what's the point of drawing three cards? When you see this like when you're dying and you're just like well the last thing you want to do is draw three cards because you have ten cards in hand they already broke too many runes. So, I think fresh start, so the way we can design our decks around this is you can, for cards like fresh start are good to me because they allow you to play more of those cards that do things immediately. So like if, so one of the dangers is if you play too many cards that do things immediately, then you are on the opposite problem where it's like you have things that do stuff immediately, but your opponent has chosen stronger threats. So you got like three firebolts in hand, so you're ready to shoot things, but they have played nothing for you to shoot. What do you do? You have three firebolt in hand, and you just start top decking, and you're top decking two drops and three drops, and your opponent's just like laughing at you. They didn't play anything from turns one through six, waiting for you to play stuff. Then they chose to use Ice Storm, and now they're playing their real game. They start playing the game, and you're not even playing a game anymore because you have firebolts, and they've got presumably top end. So fresh start is good because by putting these cards in your deck, these cards, but putting fresh start in your deck, you take out the need for other cards. Like it's my Ebonheart Slay deck does not have Fighter's Guild recruit. No, does not have Thieves Guild recruit. Excuse me. No, not this one. This this deck has zero Thieves Guild recruits. So like Thieves Guild recruit is a great card. Great card. I tell you. He and I go a long way back. We love each other. But fresh starts are in the deck to replace him. They're, by replacing Thieves Guild recruits with fresh starts, we enable us to play other cards that can do things faster, that do something immediately. Rapid Shot technically does something immediately. It's not uncommon to use Rapid Shot just to kill something. In the most desperate case scenarios, you just use Rapid Shot to kill one toughness creature. Squish the Wimpy does something immediately. Like, it actually does something immediately. Sanctuary Pet does something immediately. Uh, by putting out, by taking out some of these cards, but Morag Tong, for example, and Fresh Start like each other, because Morag Tong's problem is she's really good in some matchups, but you don't like her, and if you put too many 1-drops, this deck has 13 1-drops. 13 1-drops and 3 zero drops There's 20... There's 16 cards that are less than one magic or less. And because of this, it's possible that you draw too many of these cards. Too many of these cards means you're in big trouble in some situations. So Fresh Start is, is a reliable card in these situations. So if you've built your deck in a way that you have plays early and you know that uh, if you need to refill your hand, you just need to stall out to find those cards. So that means when you use Merchant's Camp, like there are certain games, it's like Merchant's Camp Fresh Start. It's like when you can ignore Fresh Start, that's a good place to be. Like if your deck can afford to ignore Fresh Start, 
but also be able to rely on it when you need it. I know that doesn't make full sense because I'm kind of tired, so I'm not I'm not wording it properly. So we could, <laughs> we could try that again. So when you're building your deck, Fresh Start allows you to play less greedy cards. Theranos, they're not Fresh Start. That's a very good idea. I do not have Therana, so thank you for that idea. That is very interesting. That's a very interesting idea with Ice Spike. I've seen Petamax use Ice Spike, play 50 Ice Spikes in one game with Therana. Just Ice Spike, Ice Spike's a card that says draw a card, deal two damage. So if you use Therana and use Ice Spike over and over again, your deck is infinitely full of Ice Spikes. So if you just used Ice Spike, Ice Spike, Ice Spike, Ice Spike with Therana, your whole deck is Ice Spikes. Each Ice Spike reproduces more Ice Spikes, and you can kill your opponent's turn. Now, you actually need APM for that, like which is funny. In a computer card game, you need APM. But it's interesting how Fresh Start could fit in that. So I was saying, when you, when you build a deck with Fresh Start, it allows you to build, to put in smaller creatures, Firebolts, one drops, zero drops, without feeling like, oh, I'm not, I like, I didn't run into the right matchup, now I'm screwed. Because, like, there are times where you have, like, too many one drops, and then you just feel screwed because they don't, your one drops cannot push the win, and now you're out of cards. Fresh Start is actually such a powerful card. Drawing three cards, you see, it's possible to do this. You say to draw three cards might not be that good. Draw three cards literally can be draw three cards. One of those cards is a Scout's Report. Scout's Report finds Rapid Shot. Rapid Shot find Merchant's Camel. Merchant's Camel find Necromancer. Necromancer find Cicero. Cicero use Archer's Gambit with Brotherhood Sanctuary. Can's completely refilled. So it's actually a chain in that deck that I showed you. It's a chain reaction card. It's like when you're out of cards, this card finds you cards that finds you more cards that finds you more cards. And using certain things like Torvox Torchness, Hiss Pages, etc., Iraq and Venom Tongues, it's possible and very common actually to be ramped to so much Magicka and just have no cards. So I think the worst case scenario is just you can't play it, so you mitigate that with more cards that you can play. And then because it draws you cards, it actually synergizes well with that. So if you have more one-drops, this is like their friends, right? So much so you could take out five, Thief's Guild Recruit. Now the average case scenario of this card is I think, um, I think it on average it actually finds value. If you built the deck correctly and you had some card draw cards, the presence of this card can replace Indural Masterminds. Because, believe it or not, Indural Masterminds and all those card draw cards, their only real advantage over Fresh Start is if you use Ulfric's Uprising. If you're not using Ulfric's Uprising, this card's just objectively better. Because, like, what are you doing playing Indural Mastermind? You don't care about a 2-1 body. All you care about is just drawing more cards. And the thing is, drawing cards has to, is, is very polar. There's situations where you just don't want to draw cards at all, and then there's situations that all you want to do is draw cards. So the thing is, if in the situation A, where you don't want to draw cards, you're going to draw a lot of cards because your opponent's breaking runes and they're giving you cards. So regardless, you're going to have cards. In situation B, you want to draw cards, but your opponent's not breaking runes and you have, you're just playing Indral Master and just draw cards. In those cases, Fresh Start's perfect. So by putting Fresh Starts in your deck, it's like a Control Deck's Wilds Incarnate, but better. Because Wilds Incarnate's a seven drop, draw two. This is draw three. Not only is it draw three, it's co competitively priced because a Thieves Guild Recruit is two Magicka draw cards, so it's basically three Thieves Guild Recruit. So, by putting this in your deck, you guarantee you'll have card draw. Against aggro, they're giving you a lot of cards, so you don't even need to play this card. Versus control, they'll give you the space to play this card. Versus mid-range, you don't play this. If they're even playing this, you're a control deck. Probably, probably, but I'm pretty sure aggro assassins could run this deck as well. Like an ag aggressive assassin deck, and ag actually aggressive decks could probably run this instead of Wilds Incarnate as the top end. Like they can curve out with six drop, so they can be a bunch of one drops, and then they have fresh starts at the end just to refuel to finish them off. Find Tazcat, find Nikano. So I forgot that application. So there is, there is that. So it's not completely a control card. This could be easily put into. Aggressive decks. 
And I think the best case scenario with this card and the worst case, the best case and average case scenario are pretty similar. It's basically wait for the time, wait for the right turn. There's always going to be a right turn for fresh start. And the only time that it's not the right time is when you're getting attacked. And so if you built the deck where you have tools to play there, then you'll have the ability to just wait on it. Like you can just wait on this card. And if you find yourself losing too often with too many cards in your deck, just start thinning out those card draw cards. And I wouldn't blame Fresh Start. Look at the other card draw cards. Like, look at your card draw cards and take out card draw cards if you think there's too many. And if if it's Indoor Mastermind, why not just take out Indoor Mastermind and keep Fresh Start in? Give it a try. See which one's better. Probably Fresh Start's way better than Indoor Mastermind because Indoor Mastermind's three. It's two Indoor Masterminds still doesn't draw you what Fresh Start. Two Indoor Masterminds is six Magicka draws you two. And it, and it takes two slots from your deck. Fresh Start only takes one. So we've talked about Ultimate Highs. We are tired. Hi, Mr. Glowworm. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for hanging out with us, guys. We have officially beaten our own record. We are three hours and 41 minutes to do green. <laughs> I do not know. I don't know how this happens. Oh, we're going to need to, like... We need to have a timer, and we need to get more disciplined when when doing set reviews because three hours and forty one minutes of talking is pretty pretty hard. Like sometimes I wish I was an immortal. Like I wish that like my body could not perish, like my eyes would not get tired, that my voice would get tired. I just like keep going. I think my um, when I look at my body, I think my brain is has more power than my eyes and my body. So I kind of wish that my brain, like I think I wish everything got like upgraded so we'd, we would be able to like keep going. Cause like if it, if it was up to me, I would probably talk for even much longer, but I'm physically not capable. Where do you get the energy? From, from God, from you guys? From the cards? I don't know. Thinking is fun. Thinking is fun. But I feel like being a glasses wearer, my eyes are the are the are the would be the are the first to go. So I had to actually like close my eyes and stop looking at the screen. So I gotta like switch the card, then I have to like close my eyes and then see the card with my mind's eye. Because if this is looking at the cards the whole time, oh my goodness, that'd be too much. So we're going to host somebody, guys. Thanks for thanks for hanging out. I am not promising that we'll do the other colors, yellow, red, and blue. These are like the invade colors. And I'm not anti-invade or anything like that. So I'm, it's, not, it's not that I'm anti-invade. But I have a feeling, like there are actually very good cards that are not invade within red, blue, and yellow. But uh, we're definitely not forcing ourselves. Like we don't, we don't view streaming and we don't view um, set review as like, like it's all for fun. Like it's not, it's not to, it's not to get anything. So I just, I did want to do the green and purple because they didn't have invade colors, and I know so many people had so much. You're welcome. You're welcome, Doc. And we'll put this on YouTube. And my recommendation, since it's so long, don't worry about ever watching the whole thing. But just think of it as a resource. Like, if you ever wanted to look at a card again, to just look at a specific card. Because we did it sequentially. So between 0, zero and 12, you could basically skip. You'd know, just by scrolling randomly, you'd know where to go further down and go further back. I felt like I felt like actually people were one of the reasons why we were motivated to make the set review was we really well we really did like Jaws of Oblivion we really did like we got our top ten in Jaws of Oblivion and the thing is we saw so many Reddit posts about invade socks we saw so many things about Jaws like people quitting the game 
And I respect everyone's decisions to do whatever they want to do. But I think the way people thought and think, even today, think of Invade and think of Jaws of Oblivion is a little bit off. Like what I mean is some people are thinking of Jaws of Oblivion as like this horrible expansion that like Invade is this unbeatable, unfun to play against deck. And my my belief is that Invade was one of the f most fun decks to play against. It, it, think about it this way. All these Invade decks were so similar. They were so similar. If you cracked the code on how to beat Invade, you would have gotten so many wins. That's exactly what happened. But I'm also really proud of our success in uh, Jaws of Oblivion because one, we didn't play Invade to get top 10. Second of all, anyone who played on the last day, high tier Elder Scrolls Legends, will tell you the last day of October 31st last season did not resemble October 30th at all. October, October 30th was like Invade Wars. October 31st, Invade was gone. So we had to completely adapt to a completely different metagame in one day. So, but overall, I just feel like the Jaws of Oblivion set is a very good set. Like, and the Scout colors, green and purple, my favorite colors are Scout. So green and purple has zero cards that are Invade. Like, so people, so if you just, if you type Invade, if I type, if I type Invade, they're only in red, blue, and yellow. So if you look at Jaws of Oblivion, there's actually a lot of good stuff in green and purple. And we, like there is a lot of good stuff in these two decks and the, none of them are invade cards. So, and I have some other friends who hit top 10 as well uh, last season and they weren't doing it with invade. Some of them did, some didn't. But the idea is, I think there's something about the attitude of saying it's invade despair that doesn't make sense to me. Well, I, it kind of does, but the way I prefer to enjoy computer card games is that if, I'll answer your question in a second. The way I view it this way, if um, alien invaders attacked your home and they used advanced technology can you cry like is that even a is that even a possible response you're overpowered they're shooting us with laser beams you're overpowered like dude they don't give a shit like your job if you're actually getting invaded is to fight back and find a way even if it doesn't look like there's a way to look at your existing technology your own card collection figure out a new solution to the problem and i think that the players that did think creatively found many solutions to invade and that's that's actually something that i thought was a pretty dramatic was because if you look at reddit posts there's so many people who are just like i this is the last hill i'll choose to die on so like the idea is they they viewed it as like oh this invade thing it's so strong it's too strong like, like i don't like everything about invade i don't like the singularity of invade i don't like the fact that invade card invade cards can't be played in non-invade decks like that just feels like a design choice I would not have liked to make. I would have preferred, like, because I own all the Invade Legendaries, right? And I'll tell you right now, I feel very bad about the fact that I can't play them in any Invade, in any non-Invade deck. Like, if it's like, if I put Invade, it's like, well, that card's useless. I can't put it in any other Guildsworn deck but Invade. Like, I would rather own one copy of a Legendary that can be played in a lot of decks than these cards that can only be played in this kind of deck. This shoehorn is a single deck. But still, the, the idea of saying, hey, if a real life invader came, shouldn't we use our brains to like overcome it? And I'm saying there's a gap. There are a lot of people who've just given up. And then there are a number of people who found out how to break invade, as in break, as in beat invade. 
Is there... Uh, uh, people have to hold with the change. How do you think the cursed decks would do? Oh, they do amazing. 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 Like, amazing. I think they do amazing. I don't know exactly, because I didn't play the Cursed Goblin deck, but I'll tell you, a large part of us crushing... So, we are able to crush Invade primarily with our, our Ebonheart deck. And the main idea was, Ebonheart... Okay. Versus Invade, even when it was overpowered, their turn 6, they always pass. Every time they've turned 6, they always pass. Who, what do you think I was playing? Fresh Start. They pass their turn six, I play fresh start. Exactly. Every single game against Invade. It's not even joking. So like it was it came to a point like the predictability factor of Invade is tremendous. Sure, they have a lot of danger potential, but good, but it is possible to put yourself out of lethal range. It's actually possible to put yourself in a position where they can't kill you in one turn. And they keep passing their turns. Like they literally pass turns one through six like like i'm gonna say they're passing they're like maybe they invade and bounce something back to the hand but turns one through six nothing's happening there are a lot of decks i believe that love this in this deck is just one of the decks that loves this they just so you're gonna just pass and play nothing okay i'm gonna put um i'm just gonna stack up on a bunch of cards in my hand i'm gonna ramp i'm gonna put a couple lethal creatures in position we're gonna have like a bunch of crossbows in her hand so when you decide to put your gate down we're just gonna like crossbow crossbow rage it's like the freest wins ever it's hilarious like especially if you think about the mo like the psychological motivation of people playing invade and by the way we we improved our play against invade because we actually gave it a try like once we cracked up all the legendaries we actually took the time to learn how to play invade and once we learned Invade, it's like, oh, now we can read them like open book. It's like, you learned how to play it, now you understand how to play what they do. If you don't know what they do, then it becomes a little bit harder to counter them. But we, as far as the uh, Telvani deck, and Telvani's Scout and Wound, Sheerpoint Dragon, Zivkin, Banelord just instantly kill things. Like, Zivkin, Banelord, and the Three Feather Warchief instantly kill 50 HP gates. Sifkin, Banelord, and Shearpoint Dragon just completely annihilate their warded, charging, gear, everything. Alright, we'll, we'll hang out another time, and we'll talk again. I should do this sometime, Poppy CPSO. Well, thank you, thank you for your love.